Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our channel, Our Scientology Stories, Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and I'm going to introduce to you my co-host, Janice Gillum Grady. Hi, Janice. Hi. How are you doing Aloha, today? Aloha, Mark. Today, everybody. <laughs> Aloha, <Janice>. What? <laughs> I said aloha to you, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep. We're going to have an exciting um, interview today. Yeah, uh, I will let we Mark do his thing first. Yeah, before we start, everybody get in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from, okay? And uh, so we can get a bunch of people in here. We've got a, a great guest that we're going to be interviewing and lots of great photos and things you've never seen before. I see, hey, John Sasowski is in from northeastern Pennsylvania. John, we gave uh, the Gumbies to our dogs, right, Janice? Didn't you give your Gumbies last night to your dogs? Yes, uh, and I videoed it for you. I'll put it on Facebook later. But I found myself, if I walked barefooted around the house, I kept stepping on little green pieces. <laughs> oh, they actually chewed through it. My dog oh, hasn't yeah. chewed through it yet. <laughs> anyway, John, thanks very much for that. We got Stone Mountain, Georgia in the house, New York City, Denmark, Scotland. Hey, we, we have Germany. Matt and Amy in the house. Oh, do we? Yes. I saw we Matt. Do. I saw Matt and Zane. Yeah, and, and he said too. he and Amy are watching. Oh, fabulous. Hi, Matt and Amy. And I'm sure Jim, our, our guest, is going to want to say hello as well. Uh, who else is in here? East Texas. Um, yeah, Mofo and Koalacom are here. <laughs> uh, Wisconsin, Denmark. I think I already said that. Northern California, Norway, right? Wow. Mojave City, Oklahoma, Africa, South Africa again. Okay, Sweden, Alberta, Canada, Spokane, Washington. Uh, well, we've got a lot of people in here. This is really great. Anyway, um, Without further ado, Janice, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our special guest for the day. Okay, yep. um, this is a this is a person um, that I knew at the Gold Base, and uh, he was integral in a lot of the things that I that I worked on uh, when I worked for David Miscavige, and he he oversaw the construction of a lot of the major buildings at the gold base in Gilman Hot Springs. And uh, and then it, eventually I sent him up along with a bunch of other people after L. Ron Hubbard died up to Creston after uh, to take care of the ranch up there and work for Pat and Annie Broker. But I haven't talked to uh, our guests just until about 10 minutes ago, you know, since we've been out. And, and so it's, it's real a pleasure for me uh, to introduce to everybody uh, James Mortland and we call him Jim. Jim Mortland. How you doing, Jim? Great. How are you guys? You look good. Really good. Thanks for coming on the show with us, Jim. Sure. Are you actually in Every Hawaii, Mark? No, I'm not. I'm in Las Vegas. Along oh. with Janice. I just, Hawaiian shirts has been my thing for a long oh, time. Yeah. So, you know, I try and wear a different Hawaiian shirt each time. But uh, anyway. He's right. now on his second round of wearing Hawaiian shirts. Yeah, I've got like 35 or 40 of them. So I just sort of rotate through one after the other. Good for you. Uh, Anyway, hey, Tori Christman's in the house. Hi, Tori. We just want to hi, say hi Tori. to you. And Goldie Goldie is in, and she's moderating. Clearwater Chad's in the house. We want to say hi to Clearwater Chad. Anyway, um, uh, Jim, let's get started. You know, one thing I don't know about you is I don't even know how you got – I know you're from Michigan, and Michigan State's a big, a big you know, uh, thing for you. But how did you get into Scientology? I don't even know. And how did you get at the Gold Base? Maybe uh, there you go. Go Spartans. Um, well, can you tell yeah. me briefly? How you got in Scientology and how you ended up at the Gold Base? Well, I went to, I was going to college, um, went, spent three years. I was a pre law, it was criminal justice school. Michigan State and Cornell had the top two schools for that subject at the time. I thought maybe, you know, I wanted to do that. You know, I grew up pretty naive. I was thinking I could be like a Perry Mason or, you know, one of those kind of guys. But anyway, when I learned about the law after three years, I was a little pretty confused. You know, I studied a lot of history psychology, mm -hmm. religion for my last few years, kind of wasting my college the last year, but I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. So I left before my senior year and I traveled from Michigan to San Diego, stayed with my sister. Then I hitchhiked up to first Seattle where a guy approached me on the street, you know, body router. He said, had you heard of Dianetics? And I said, no, and he did, that was it. He, I just kept going. And he, well, four days later, I went back to Portland, Oregon and Oddly, another guy said, hey, have you heard of Dianetics? And this time I could say, yes, the guy just mentioned the word to me. So anyway, long story short, they uh, 
So let me just explain the basic sub point about the reactive mind, I, and the analytical mind in that relationship. And I like that kind of in a split second, codified a lot of stuff I've been studying and couldn't probably articulate very well. So I was interested in it. I never, and I started reading the book. I didn't do an OCA or they probably would never have let me in. <laughs> no, I, but I, that was what got me interested. So then I did the comm course and I did NED in Portland. Same time, like um, Eric Newsom was there just starting. And so, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no kidding. I didn't know you guys were, were close. Oh, yeah. Eric Newsom? Yeah, before oh, wow. he became my junior in the States for years. <laughs> yeah. Jim, we've yeah. got a lot of audience that have never been in Scientology. So we oh. have to be careful on the terms we're using, like All right. the OCA test and NED. Those are things they won't know. Okay. So sorry. Well, you ex we explain. We'll explain for them. Anyway, you don't worry. Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. Um, so anyway, I did those. I liked the courses a lot. And then I was recruited to join the Sea Org. And this is now, it was in December of 79 mm -hmm. in Oregon. And I just, I was working, doing roofing up there for a while. That's my first sort of construction job. Anyway, in, in March, I went to the New World Corps. I don't know if they know what the New World Corps was, but it was sort of a special yeah. unit that was created with some at that point, technology that was developed to improve auditor training, the quality of that, and also for staff, which got me really interested. It's its intent, and I've read all the advices in HCOBs, and it was fascinating, was designed to make the staff members more competent and more able to operate as a team without all the aberration that a group can get into. And anyway, that was the plan. But anyway, so from there, I was there until 82 when I went – you know, quote unquote, over the rainbow or whatever. I went to the base. It was the time it was called the summer base S. Yeah. Um, and that became, it was gold. Gold wasn't really known at the time when I started in, in 1980. <clears throat> and I was up there as the senior CSN, the senior case supervisor international, Ray Midoff, who was brand new. Uh, the prior one was still there running around a pole with some of his David staff. Mayo. Yeah. David Mayo, yeah. <laughs> um, so I was his org officer. Uh, I started off as that, and I was there. I was doing that for about two years, got in trouble. <laughs> and then uh, Vicky Asnaran put me on and put me into the HU uh, at that point. Household, that household unit for L. Ron Hubbard right. because he, he still was alive. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I organized all his libraries, of which there was five, put in the Dewey Decimal System and all that kind of thing. And it took care of all the gifts he would get and organize them. And some of them would be sent to him. Um, and I would see his little handwritten note come back about where he wanted certain things. Like he had a, what do you call those steers in Texas? Longhorns. Yeah. He wanted it put on some car. I, you know, I had to turn that over to JB or the, the car guys at the time. Uh, David Lance. Where, where was the CO, who was the CO, uh, the commanding officer for the household unit? Was it Walter yet or no? No. Walter was replaced me after I went to Creston. Walter Kotrick, we're talking about. Anyway, Correct. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a good question. I kind of go blank. Who was the CEO? Because I generally dealt with Janadair, who was the deputy senior messenger for the household unit. Right. And there was a period of time we actually didn't. Oh, I know. John Paulson. Do you remember John Paulson? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sure, I remember him. Yeah. yeah sorry. He was, he was there, and then I replaced him later. Um, I don't know. Everybody got in trouble here and there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in 85, right after, in fact, Janice then became the deputy senior messenger over the HU. Um, That's right. And I had gotten my first illness. I had been sick for literally 14 years, and I was sick as a dog. And that weekend, I found out that the weekend he departed, and we had this big event in L.A. the following month, Tuesday or something like that, and you know, we didn't know what it was about at the time. And that's when I first meet Pat Broker. And just so you know, the whole time we were working in the HU, Pat Broker was never around. Sometimes you'd see his initials, PB. Yeah. But generally, it was Annie. She would be the only one that would write to us about yeah. whatever, needing things. So anyway, that was my first time seeing him. And then I guess seeing her, I think, if I recall, she was on the stage. Was she not? Or no? Yes. 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 She, not that one. She was at the March 13th event. Yeah, yeah think you're right. right. And I was at the ranch yeah. at that one. I remember when she was sent, yeah. that was like her big reintroduction, I guess. You're right. That was when I was up there. So that I went up there in February within about three weeks, four weeks of his passing. I was sent to Crest with everybody else. 
Um, one of the things that's interesting to me, in hindsight, even at the time, I didn't understand it, it created a major confusion on day one of arriving there was we spent two days full time, myself, Phil Sherlock, all the guys coming from base to go up there. And I was supposed to be the CO of the commanding whatever. officer. Yeah, sorry, commanding officer in charge up there. But in those two days, we were under Norman, who was the executor of the will. Norman Starkey, yeah. And Dave. I'm yeah. assuming everybody here knows who Dave is. Right. David Miscavige. Can I just say Dave or DM or just <laughs> Dave is fine. It doesn't matter. They're, they're you know, I mean, the, there's other names and everybody calls I could say, yeah. But I, you know, I don't want to say something not. No, don't worry about it. Or whatever. So we spent two days there. And the whole point of what they were briefing us on, and me in particular, because I had Phil Sherlock under me, who was in charge of the finances for the ranch. And he had to deal with David Lance, who was, of course, the former, you know, household unit uh, transport in charge. So they were the two guys that had to keep track of all the money because there was this intermediate point where the will was supposed to be under, you know, have to go through whatever challenges. And then it would become part of CST, which is Church of Spiritual Technology. They know that, right? Right. 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 That's correct. Which was the thing set up for all of, you know, his recordings, books, everything. Yeah. You know. uh, anyway, so two days were spent there. They just go hammering not to spend things and do all this stuff. And that, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it's okay. Norman, Norman was supposed to be my boss. Okay. The day we go there, we go up with Dave and Norman, all of us, her, Matt's, Gelda, all these guys. That day I'm introduced to Annie. And then that whole day, everybody's up there. We have a nice meal. I get taken around the place. I see Pat Broker on a backhoe just digging some hole somewhere. Like to this day, I don't know what he was doing. Um, but that was an interesting thing because the first thing, and again, if you want me to stop talking and say or pause or whatever. But, well, I was going to say, we're going to go through some slides, which will actually oh, okay. help to illustrate some of the stuff. But no, I appreciate everything you're saying. I mean, you're 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 refreshing my memory on a lot of things too. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's an important so, thing that happened that day. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, go, let me go ahead and put up some slides here. Okay. So we can walk people through it. Okay. And then you can comment. Uh, okay. This is a, uh, we're going to talk about the gold base and also the Creston ranch with Jim. And uh, this is a pic photograph of Jim, of course. And uh, Jan, uh, go ahead, uh, Janice, this is when you go ahead and describe what this is here for you. Yeah, Jim. this is um, much of this year in Virginia, where Cheryl, who's in the front right, and myself, the back right, we visited Ronnie Miscavige, Dave's older brother. He's in between Cheryl and I. And on the other side of the table, there's Jim smiling away there and his uh, lovely wife, Sarah. We right. had a great time, huh, Jim? Yeah. Hope you like that restaurant. It's a good one. Yeah, it was. And, it was very good. And you're in the Williamsburg area of Virginia? Correct. Yeah, I'm from Northern Virginia, so that's why oh, I was. Really? Did that. How did you all end up down in Virginia by chance? Just, just as a quick, quick aside. Yeah, well, I can jump forward on my timeline here. Yeah, when we came again when we were sent out. I was told it was from Dave or RTC sent Sarah with me, which was a shock, and she didn't know I, that. None of us knew it. Literally, before we're leaving, I'm sent to the old BPI building. You guys remember that Bridge Publications building at the PAC. Yeah, I've been in the RPS, RPS, RPF, RPF, RPF for when I left the. Uh, well, we're, we're kind of we've jumped way ahead, but anyway, when I I come down, and I didn't see her for a month because I'm you know and she hadn't seen me, so long and short of it was we're to leave literally that you know, in the next thirty minutes, um, I had gone to rent a car with somebody who was trustworthy, the former uh, IFD. Forget her name. I can see her face so clearly, but she was German. International finance director, IFD. Oh, yeah, they had nice dark <laughs> black hair. So anyway, that's how we got there. We drove, I drove to my dad who has, a, he's a retired professor and he was living in Green Valley, which is just south of Tucson. Right, that's in Arizona. Did. Yes, sorry. So we and went this there. Is, this is when you were, this is when you basically left the Sea Org, right? Or were you kicked out? Right. Yeah. Right. We'll so go I go there. We'll go and that's, yeah. Yeah. So we go there. My dad, you know, like, who's this person? Because the last person he knew was Amy. 
But Amy and I hadn't seen each other, and I could be into, a little incorrect, but I believe it's at least a year. She was sent to flag, and I'm, you know, I was persona non grata to the nth degree at that point. I mean, I've been persona non grata up and down for my pretty much my whole career. And you'd been in the SEAL how long when they kicked you out? Uh, 19 years. 19 years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so when I get there, I got a call from my dad who says Amy had called him. I was like, great, because I have no idea how to contact her or anything. I just knew she was in the flag RPF. That's kind of all I knew. And I, I called her or she called me and I was on a phone and she was explaining to me about her and Matt. And that was, it was great. I mean, I was just glad she was doing well. And the fact she could talk, you know, <laughs> we could communicate at all <laughs> was amazing. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I had known Matt. Matt was literally the second person Sorry, the third person that met me all the way back when I first arrived at the base in 82. First right. person was Jure Rathbone. when I got out in the middle of the night. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know her at all, but she welcomed me. And then the next morning, the first guy that I meet is Dave. I'm in mm -hmm. there at breakfast, and he comes in, this guy with all the gold. You know, somebody shorter than me, which I thought was a shock. But he was very <laughs> nice then, but I didn't know who he was. So I think it was Matt who was in charge of security. I think that's like six three that right away because he's security. He said, Oh, that's yeah. David Miscavige. I go, okay. I didn't I, I know it about some of the earlier, you know, I knew Janet there and I knew about you know Gail and you know some of those. Yeah. So anyway, so that's that part. In terms of Amy and I, when when we're talking on the phone, that was where she was going to, you know, I think I gave her the address or I got her address and how to I forget who sent what to whom, but we then finally were able to end the thing. And then a week later, I married, you know, Sarah. Yeah. And you so and Sarah have been married how Sarah. long now? 17 years. 17 18. years. Oh, my gosh. She's going to kill me if I got this wrong. 19 years. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Sarah and Jim. And looks like you've got a dog. I don't know the dog's name. Well, that's Joseph. And he's passed away now. Now we've got two other dogs. A big black okay. lab called Shadow. And then a, a little uh, Australian well, a mix. It's a, it's a shepherd and uh, Australian cattle dog named Kaya, who's a maniac. I love them both. So, And then Janice explained, Sarah is uh, related. Uh, she's Sarah Blythe, right? That's her maiden name? Correct. Yeah, she, she's Biddy Miscavige's youngest sister, or which one is, of them. Right, which is why we thought I was set with her or something, because they didn't want to just send, you know, this is, I think we actually got this later from talking with Ronnie and Biddy, which is another part that will come up, how I got to Williamsburg via Arizona. Okay. Is when we, out of the blue, Biddy calls us when, you know, in that same first couple of weeks we're in Arizona. We got, apparently, Biddy and Ronnie had talked to, they were able to talk to the International Director of Inspections and Reports at FLAG because of who they were, their family, right? And she, they found out where we were. <laughs> Yeah. So it was a totally unsanctioned call, but it was great. We you know, we called and talked to them, and she explained because I was looking for work because mostly what I had done was construction. So that was where I kind of was created a resume out of my twenty years of designing and building stuff. You know, so I don't know if I've missed a beat somewhere, but that's kind of oh that. no no that's good. I just yeah I just wanted to introduce you, Sarah. I know she was related to Biddy and all that. And, and that's and then, why of course, she was living here in Williamsburg with Ronnie. Right. So at that point in their life, you know, Sarah, they really, you know, again, they've been separated, really not able to have, you know, any kind of quote, normal sibling life. So we decided to go there. And I, I had lined up several jobs, actually at construction people all the way up to Alexandria and even down to Virginia Beach and ended up I got offered two of them and I took the one that was here in Williamsburg for logistical reasons. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, I was going to show, so this, these are the photos like uh, for everybody who doesn't know the Amy he's talking about is Amy Scobie uh, and Jim and Amy. Uh, this is, uh, she sent us these photographs. This is your wedding day on the right. Right. And this what? is a picture from there. Um, how long were you guys uh, married? 17 years. I 17 think. years. Yeah. 17 or 18. Yeah. Yeah, and that's you back the back then. I don't remember this wedding. I saw pictures of it. Here's the wedding party. Janice, you're over there on the right, correct? Yeah. Yes, I'm the uh, second from the right, 
with holding on to Rowan in front of me, Rowan yeah. Holwich. Yeah, you know what? And that's Mike Eldridge right next to me. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, to the left. Yeah, that your... Matt's. That's Matt's Markowitz next to Walter Kotrick. Again, we were on the self-sufficiency project when we left the ranch under Todd Alexander as the corporate liaison I see at that point. Right. And that was a project to basically so that uh, the Gold Base could grow its own food and, and that type of thing, right? Yeah, there were certain advices that um, Hubbard had done in 78 and 79 when there was a huge oil issue. There was the creation of OPEC, if you, you know, if you ever wondered about the yeah. oil producing countries from Arabia. That began in 78 when we lost, you know, there was lines for gas and all this stuff. Anyway, that kind of began a lot of his earlier research, including looking at solar power. We did, we did all kinds of studies and research and came up with a whole plan to do it. None of it got done for late. You know, I think he was just keeping us busy, to be honest. He didn't know what to do with us. <laughs> but but so that's Matt Markowitz on the left, then Walter yep. Kotrick, second right. in from the left. I don't know who the other uh, – Mike Eldridge is the fourth one in, but I don't know who the third one in is. Well, I think I know who that is. That's the guy that Amy may know. He was a fine, He was a WDC member, Watchdog Committee. I just went blank on his I know. Name. Very oh, no, no, I, I – yeah, he was um, European, right? I remember this face. No, he's totally American. Oh, American. Okay. But right. I think Amy would recognize him. He was. Um, and then. Go ahead. No, I think I just went blank on his name. He's very quiet. To Tom me. Ashworth. That's it. Amy oh, that's just Tom Ashworth. That. Oh, okay, cool. that's that's who it is. I'm good. With okay. I don't recognize him. Yeah. Names, you know. And then, well, uh, I, can, then I got, can name the ladies. Yeah, I was going to say, then there's Mike Eldridge and then you, and then go ahead, there's Amy. Go Amy's ahead, the bride, Liz. and yeah. behind her is Jana Deere, and then there's myself hold and on, Roman. Hold on, Jan hold on, Jana Deere Swanson. Jana Deere Swanson. <laughs> and then myself with Rowan Horwich. Yeah. And then the one on the end is Liz Ingber, who I have been calling out for not communicating with her parents since the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, because her brother Andrew Barton is missing. Oh, really? I remember Andrew. Yeah, yeah we yeah. haven't been able to find him. And yeah. Anyway, yeah, so he, that's that was WDC Reserve. That's right. That's what I'm. Yeah. He, he remember that. And we're we're in touch with Tom. Tom's in the Phoenix area. He's a great guy. I, I always like Tom. Anyway, so that's that. And then here's a picture of that's Matt, Sarah, Amy, and Jim. Yeah, and that's when, when was that taken? Boy, this is where you put me on the spot. Probably about almost 10 years ago, maybe, 8 to 10. That's here in Williamsburg. That's actually Yorktown. That's uh -huh. the place where we won our independence, the famous York Battle. That's yeah. Yorktown, right behind it. And the York River, you can kind of see a sliver of it there over our shoulder. Yeah, we went. You took, you took Cheryl and I there. Yeah, we take. Yeah, we have a whole routine. We take. <laughs> there's a <laughs> yeah. lot to see, but there's certain things we. I, you know, I, I'm a big history buff, and I. I yeah, love. Jim, I'm the same way, and that's one of the great things about Virginia. I grew up in Virginia. Is history is all around you. You go a town over, and then some Civil War battle happened there, or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay, great. Anyway, so that's that, and then uh, we're gonna go by over. Being at the gold base, like I remember working with you on, like you were you were involved in the LRH Music Studio, right? Uh, with Correct. Steve Willett and Andre Tabioyan, right? Correct. They did the there. It was there's two major renovations of it. Then the second one, I was in, when literally everything was gutted and we redid everything. You know, bringing it up to the. I have. I think I have photos of the inside of that in a second. But <laughs> just so everybody knows, before L. Ron Hubbard died, he was in hiding, and we nobody knew where he was. And it, and in 1982-83, it was like get the base ready for his return because we're going to get the all clear and clear all the legal lawsuits because he wants to come back to the base, right? And one of the main things he wanted to do was record music. So a music studio, which you see here in this photograph, was a state of the art for that time period. It was a state of the art studio. It was built from the ground up using almost all Sea Org members. I mean, I think there were some uh, uh, contractors that had to raise beams and things like that, but I mean, everything was done. And Steve Willett, I think, was in charge along with Andre. And then, of course, mm -hmm. you were involved, I think, at some point, at least doing work. And then this is the inside of the studio. Is this what you're talking about when it was redone? Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot of things that were redone, but it's also a lot of electrical. Everything was changed to fiber optic being mm-hmm. there. New design, and you can see if you look at the head, a brand new mix board. It was even a bigger one. There was just a oh, lot bigger of- than the Massenberg board. Yeah, the Massenberg. Wow. Was, excuse me, that was that was the same. But uh, do you remember Gary Lou Luigi? Yeah. yeah, yeah, Luigi. Yeah, he had come up along with Steve Marlowe, who was the LRH's mm-hmm. audiovisual in charge, a new right. better acoustic thing, and that's the drum room you see in the right there through that picture that's where the drums were there's also a, a vocal place you can't see it in this photo but yeah. all the acoustics we had to strip everything down and a different layering of different densities of material the whole thing was was redone that way yeah and the whole design was that the musicians in the actual studio portion they'd be looking towards the control room window so basically the idea was uh, that it would be like a stage, like you see stage lights up there and and that uh, the musicians would be playing towards the control booth, which would be the audience, right? And then this is inside the control room here, right. looking through the window on the left. And then you see theater seating in the back. And then along the wall, you see these people that are on there. Now that's been redone. Um, you can see the mix board there in the center. That's uh, That looks like the Massenburg mix board. Yeah. But, um, they had, they did embroidery uh, of people as part of the renovations on the original one. I think you remember this, Jim. Yeah. And Janice, I was on there with my wife, Julie, and yep. David and Shelly, and they had different executives' faces in those, uh, you know, like on the wall in the back. And I'm not surprised they had to redo it because we were on there. <laughs> <laughs> so remove all the embroidered SPs. Yeah. But that's the inside of the uh, uh, the control room, and it definitely does look different. So you you were involved with that too. Yeah, to the second part of it, there was also a whole new sound system, new speakers, and that even looks like it's been changed again. This looks like a third iteration because yeah. the speakers we did were those tall. It's called the Professional Monitor Company out of England, huge yeah. towers. That was the second version. This looks like a third one. I mean, the speakers yeah. part that kept you know always being worked on. Yeah. And then this this was another project. This is a Massacre Canyon. Well, this was the Lodges, but this is Massacre Canyon Inn or the Gilman Hot Springs. This is an old picture from before we ever bought the property. It, when they had the golf course, you can see a golfer there on the right. But that was the Lodges down there. And then uh, were you involved with the, this is Massacre Canyon Inn. This is where we ate our meals. This is uh, where the dining room was and all that. But then uh, we actually did, you guys did a major renovation on it. You were involved with that, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, that was all part of what we, you know, it was originally yeah. called the two year plan, which went for another five or six. But yeah. we actually expanded it. We, everything was gutted, new kitchen. We had some structural because it's really close to a fault line. There's a lot of things like that done. But yeah. Yeah, that's this is an aerial shot of that. Um, the Master Canyon, the dining room. We called it MCI, but uh, it's much bigger than it was originally right and then i would just remember jim i don't know how long it took to do the renovations but we ate in a tent out in mm-hmm. the back and then there was a trailer that was brought a food trailer to cook the food do you remember that janice yeah. i remember i remember that definitely yep yeah i was the complaint box for everything and i understood <laughs> it's really we had to figure all this out through each you know we were doing sometimes three four five projects at a time and trying to figure out the logistics so everything kept going, and that was, that was you know, le- regardless of anything else, just the subject of construction and logistics yeah. was really, in the end, really good. I mean, I learned a lot, just kind of a cauldron of fire. I was, you know, I averaged four hours of sleep for a long period of time. But, yeah, and it was made into a state-of-the-art kitchen. I mean, it had all the great, you know, the latest stuff and for cooking and baking and all. And then, uh, you know, it got redesigned. But, yeah, I remember eating those tents and everybody was like, you know, the, if it was a windy, dusty day, it was, you know, got a lot of dirt in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and oh, you're standing in mud in line because of the rains. Yeah, it was not fun. No. Yeah. Okay, and then this is Building 36, which is the manufacturing building, and you were involved with overseeing that too, weren't you? Yeah, and designing it, hiring an architect and an engineer and doing all that from the ground up. That was an interesting one. Yeah, that's yeah, I also had the offices for gold. Yeah. 
I was going to say I had all the executive offices for gold, uh, the Hubbard Communications office, the security office. Uh, it's where all the tape manufacturing was done. The e-meters were moved in there. Everything was in there. It's a big building. Um, well, but that was built from the ground up. Isn't that the building uh, Wendell Reynolds stayed in during the big flood? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this first, uh, Jim. Now, that building there, I mean, wasn't it built majority with RPF and Sea Org labor? I mean, we didn't, we weren't hiring contractors to do that stuff, right? No, in certain parts we had to. For example, right. the, the structural steel and yeah. the concrete, the slab and the floors. Um, and most of the, the the exterior perimeter framing, and then a lot of the interior was electrical. We did all the electrical, the um, AC. We did the AC. We did some of those systems that you wouldn't generally know we did. Of course, Martin Reed was my right hand guy. He was in charge of electrical. Brilliant guy, truly. Yeah. He was self taught electrician, right? Totally. Yeah, he yeah. And he, he, and he he literally could design the whole system for the whole base. Unbelievable. There was an early electrical engineer that we had hired really early on. And he just like was a sponge, Martin was, that just learned everything. And by the end, you know, as we go through about seven, eight or more buildings, he would draw it up and the engineer would just review it and stamp it. So that was really wow. impressive. Now, I was going to tell a couple stories about this building. Before this building was built, do you remember when the basketball court was built down there by uh, Building 36? Do you well, remember yeah. the outdoor the outdoor basketball court? The first one, not the one over by the uh, G units, right? Yeah. It was, it was I remember old, Steve, Steve Willett. Yeah. Well, Steve Willett, he liked to play basketball, and I did too. And yeah. I think you guys had some leftover leftovers concrete from a pour somewhere. Yeah, and correct. so you poured a full court basketball court. Yeah. And it was fantastic, Janice. We well, played play. basketball when we I know when we had exercise time, I we would play full court basketball for like 25, 30 minutes, sometimes all the way into lunch, and we had to get back, shower and at muster at by 12 30 or 12 45 but i love that man we played we played all the time until miscavige got to the base and then it was like yep. no exercise time <laughs> well that basketball court i used to play with you guys and mike said i hated that i was a girl and people were passing me the ball yeah. but you always threw it to me but it yeah. was i was huffing and puffing running up and down the court and that's when i decided i have to stop smoking and so Amy oh, and good. I, Amy and I and Janet here all went into agreement. Okay, the three of us are going to stop smoking together. <laughs> and then I could, would catch Amy or Janet here in the bathroom smoking. But I, I put on weight, but I did stop. <laughs> well, then the other story, Jim, about that basketball court was that Sea Org Day after the basketball court was yeah. built. Um, ASI author services came up with David Miscavige and they had a team and gold had a team and, and, uh, you know, the, the, and it, it got into a fist fight because Miscavige was, was goading his ASI guy. I think it was Dave Bloomberg. He elbowed Gary Weesey in the mouth and knocked his teeth out. And it was just, it was, was crazy. A, yeah. But it was the HU. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah, it was ASI versus HU. And I had the guys, remember we had a, there's a unit called Pearl, P-U-R-L, Pack Unit Run Logistics. We yeah, had yeah, a yeah. player named Gary Madras. Oh, I remember a, Gary, yeah. Remember Gary? Whew. And we had Huff, who was, uh, gosh, what was this for? Fred, Fred Hauk. Sorry. Fred oh, Fred Hauk, Hauk. Yeah, absolutely. He was real good. good. Yeah, yeah, he, he was, was a great guard. We were beating yeah. them. And I was guarding Dave. Dave was uh -huh. doing me and he kept doing his elbow thing, but it's yeah. I mean, I you know, my hockey and football, I wouldn't take I wouldn't take that crap. But it all broke down because it actually followed Gary Modras, a hard follow, and it broke his leg. Oh yeah. And that was right. it. Everybody just went crazy. And I had Andre on my team. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and Andre was the coach of Janice's team when she was on the ship oh, in the Sea Org. Cool. I had no idea. Yeah, it was very telling about him, just that whole game. Well, and that whole Sea Org day was very telling because up at the ship, up at the swimming pool, that was when uh, oh. Miscavige 
told a bunch of ASI guys to grab Janice's sister, Terry, and throw her in the pool. And Terry refused to go. And she went all the way to her birthing room. And then Miscavige sent them to go through the window, and get her, yes. and drag her out. Oh, Six, it that. took 16 guys to drag her out of her room and dump her in the pool. And Dave's kind of proudly, see, I got you. And she's like, you're proud that it took 16 people to put me in the pool? <laughs> yeah, no, this was before he took over. This is before he became the CLBRTC. Right. But but this was this was proof that he was a he was a terrible sport. I mean, literally, he was somebody you did not want to play because he he would he would bend the rules and I mean he was terrible anyway. The, I oh, absolutely. Absolutely he was. <laughs> And he couldn't play for crap, to be honest with you. No, no, he couldn't. But, but he had Marty. Marty Rathbun was a good player. Um, yeah. you know, he had some other guys at ASI that were pretty good. But anyway, yeah. so it was it was Greg Wilhare. Boynton was, was a good player. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, we used to play, and I loved it. I got in the best shape of my life playing, and, and we was in the heat, and we didn't care. We just had a good time. But anyway, that was that. And that got torn down when the Building 36 was being brought up because that also was where Tom Cruise would land his helicopter when he flew to the base later, right before we left uh, in 1990. That was his yeah. sort of uh, heliport. <laughs> anyway, enough about Building 36. Uh, okay, now this is an aerial shot. The last building that you guys were working on when I left was the Estates building, which is up at the top right. right. That was the huge garage, and it was being renovated. And that's where Miscavige attacked me in the in the garage. Well, I remember that. that. Uh, yeah. Were you yeah. there, Mike? Oh, I remember seeing it. I came around the yeah. back, and I see Mark. Yeah. And there's somebody, and I couldn't really, at the first, as I'm coming around the back, like this side, you can see in the photo, the right side he's right in that big entrance there and Dave's yep. just punching him in the chest and, and Mark's just maintaining and just looking at him and I see so you have to look at my my perspective okay corporate liaison in charge you know he's a big deal and that's that's me is, that was me yeah but it was the physical nature of it I was like holy crap if Mark he could just go boink, and then Dave would have been flying you know but you know he maintained Civilian. What I did was I actually went down on the ground covered up because I did I didn't fight back because oh, yeah, I, I, just wanted, I want, actually wanted everybody to see how crazy he was, you know, okay. and uh, then I stood up when he stopped and I reached behind my head and it was bleeding. And I said, you made my head bleed, you know, and then he said, like, oh, I'll send down the medical officer service for your own good. And he sort of scurried off. But people always go, why didn't you fight back? Well, number one, I, I wanted people to see he was crazy. But number two was he always had four or five people with him. You know, so what are you going to do? You're going to be, you know, you're going to fight back and then have them all, you know, ground, you know, grab you. And it, it just didn't make any sense. But anyway, yeah, that was the, the garage building was that that was all being worked on and all that. And that's also around the time of the flood, which, you know, we don't have to go into the details on that. But that's when Janice, that's when you and Paul left, right? Yes. Yeah, we left. Um, I think it was Sea Org Day next week will be yeah. our 33 years out. Yeah. That was a contentious time, wasn't it, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing, and I think I mentioned it to you, Janice, or someone. But when we did what was called the two-year plan, one of the first projects that was supposed to get done was this channel that was at the top on the north side. Because this area of California is highly erosive. You get a lot of wind and rain. And, you know, you don't get a lot of rain, but at a certain time of year, you can get gully washers, you know, just a ton right. of rain, particularly in January. Anyway, the point was we did a reservoir. We built that. And next to the reservoir to protect it, it was supposed to be this channel, just like a series of steps. It's Gabion, which is simply the Italian word for those rock, right? And they're held in these wire baskets. And he never would fund it. I even went to John Epstein, who was in charge of finances. This is like, it makes no sense. We're going to start putting all this, building these buildings when you're not doing the things that are necessary to protect them. Right. So the one thing we were allowed to do was the bottom of it, which was a huge desaltation basin, huge collection place with special grates so that the water, like in other words, the mud and rock were supposed to get stopped and it would go across. Okay. So when that happened, it just, it was literally, it was called by our engineer, Webb and Associates was the name of the engineer. Mm -hmm. A thousand year rain, it was only, but it was only 20 minutes. But what they mean is in frequency, it was something they would have expected to occur that infrequently. But 
for 20 minutes, it just, bam, it just dumped. And we ran out there, and of course, I think Cruz's bag was still there with a bunch of clothes in one of the buildings called the G units, which are at the other. Yeah, and yeah they were being renovated. They were being getting ready for him. Yeah. Yeah, and they had already had some of his clothes arrived through a bag. But anyway, that kind of ruined all that because they came across the road, went through the gate, went into the top two buildings. It actually didn't go into the building, went right up to them. Anyway, we were, you know, I was on the south side when the rain started. I was literally way out near the levee where the quote unquote San Jacinto River is, which is usually dry. And I was calling on my phone to everybody to run up to the G's because security had called and said, hey, you're having, we have mud coming across the road there. So, you know, I had Matt's to go get his back on. We got everybody up we could. And I thought we did pretty good just quickly without, you know, trying to be safe at the same time, protect all that, protect anybody there. <coughs> However, we got called out. Uh, we were all sitting there soaking wet about five hours, eight hours later at MCI. You know, Rudy, I was looking down at the carpet. Thinking, this is a brand new carpet I just put in. Now we're just ruining it with mud. And <laughs> but anyway, we were called out for how we, you know, somehow it was our fault, you know, and as the you know, head of the states, it was fundamentally my fault. So I'm like, you know, I, I, whatever, you know, I just. Well, we, we know what happened, Jim, is that, you know, that. You know, uh, it's amazing nobody got killed. I mean, we were know, waist deep in mud, like waist deep in mud and water. I remember that. I was on the decks then, working on the sports fields. You know, yeah. but uh, but but that's when I was standing next to Janice's husband Paul in that call out when Miscavige came in. We were all standing at attention in front, and he was foaming like a rabid dog. I'd right. never seen anything like it. And without saying anything to each other, Paul and I both went. This guy's gone crazy. We need to get out of here. And that night, or the next day, was it Janice? Or that night, or the next day, you you blew, and I blew too. We both blew the yeah, same it day. The next, it was the next day because the next day was Sea yeah. Day, and Sea Org Day got canceled, and I couldn't get my Sea Org bonus after you know I had a bonus of three four hundred dollars coming in, which is big money in those days. Yeah. yeah. But we left. We left the same time. And I this was the second time I'd blown because I already knew that Miscavige was going crazy. And then uh, they made a mistake because the next day or two days later, Mike Sutter rounded me up at my sister's house in L.A. And the first thing he told me was, oh, Janice and Paul Grady left, too, last night. You know, and I, that that told me, you know what, I'm not crazy because, you know, you think you're crazy, particularly because, Jim, you know, we were in senior positions. I mean, Janice and I both were. And um it must have had, you know, because you weren't as close to what was going on, but it must have had an impact when, like, senior people are like, just going, I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just crazy that whole, that particular day and everything about it. Because, again, yeah. he was out of sequence. And I would tell him that. And I would, you know, and he was just, you know, you know go, to, go to the IFD. And I knew, I go to the IFD. Of course, Dave's telling the IFD, you know, you got to put money into marketing. So, you know, and Dave's still beating me up, you know, because you're talking about some of these things, but there was the film lab. There was a lot of other projects we had to do. We were still and we were working on at the time, the upper lodges, the lower lodge, the middle, and then the villas. We went yeah. through, did all those many times. Music studio too. So my point was, is like, that's where I just realized this guy is a freaking whack job beyond whatever. I'm like, what, what is he thinking we're supposed to have done? And the only reason we went in there, I had my guys go in, was because I could see it was clearing up. This was literally from a blue sky, bam, and then it was, and we only went until we could see that the water was starting to abate. But it happened so quick. We were actually on there. In fact, I probably mm -hmm. stupidly, because it was still raining, I because I was relatively close, I just drove up there, you know, and I was seeing the mud coming across the road. And that's when I called and said, no, everybody stay back until we can, you know, figured out but i just remember thinking i mean that's why engineers exist you know <laughs> that's exactly right yeah i i even remember the grading contractor that you guys were using when they were building the berms around the yeah. sports fields yeah. before that flood the guy goes you know stuff's gonna come right down that i know and go right in here you know what i'm saying i, I remember yeah, he said they, that they thought he knew better than the natural valleys <laughs> and where the hills were instead of augmenting those he's trying to like I don't know. You know, he said it like the fair of creating a new pyramid in the middle of yeah. the mile. How's that going to work? You know, 
anyway to go back to this this the the buildings right in the center there the two that's the double wides that became the hole right in the yeah. in the future uh, i don't know were you around for that i mean i know those double wides were supposed to be cmo international management temporarily is that right correct that's what they originally were for we were gonna we were that was supposed to be the next building we were supposed to make was the cmo building which was further up behind uh, as far as i know it's never been built yet that's one of the buildings it's never even been started but when I, I left before it became the whole, um, yeah. But I would, you know, because when I was there, it was it was Simo and WDC. Like Amy worked out of there. All these people, you know, that's where, yeah. that's where it was. And what, uh, what happened to Del Sol? Del Sol is part of Qual. It became oh. the auditing rooms for Qual. Got it. And oh. the course rooms are what you call Qual, the big, you know, with the stained glass window that we did. In the, yeah. So they're right next to each other. So they turn that into auditing, which of course just became sec checking. Uh, right. <laughs> well, this is here. This is it right yeah, here. You what see you're that's talking Del Sol about. in the upper left there. Yeah. yeah, the upper left. That was the CMO in WDC exec strata building when we were there. But then, Correct. like you said, you you guys that that building with the steeple that was the the old spa from Gilman Hot Springs. That right. that's where we did our study, our student, you know, our, our course rooms and right. auditing and a all library that. in the middle. And then two courses. Yeah, that the the building in the the building in the center with the chat with the steeple that wasn't there when we were there. That was a patio. It was a U shaped building, Correct. right, Jim? And then that. you guys yeah. built that. Yeah. That's and it's a beautiful beautiful space. And then right. off to the left, like you said, still Soul, and that became auditing. Right. And then That's this is an aerial view. Came. Sorry, yeah, it was when we did Del Sol and turned it into the HGC, the Hubbard mm -hmm. Guidance Center, the auditing part of it. This is an aerial view of a more recent photo, and the buildings on the right are the birthing buildings for the staff. That's another picture of it, and then this is a close-up of it. And you were involved with that. Now, what I was going to say before you start talking about it was that the pads were made for those in like 1990 when I was still there. They, you know, they bulldozed the pads and all that, and then all of the staff was moved into Hemet into apartment complexes, three different four different apartment complexes. Yep. But then I was I was amazed that they lived in Hemet for years. It took years. They never built the birthing buildings, right? Right. And they, yes, they, they probably spent apartment. millions of dollars on rent that they could have gone to just building the buildings, right? Yeah. If you got an answer as, you know, as to why, let me know. Oh, but go it, ahead. I'm sorry. He wanted us, he said, start the birthing buildings, get going. Yeah. And, and, and he, either called finance or whatever. And that's how it got started. So we all thought we were going, you know, we're going to start it. We're going to continue it and then finish it. Instead, it just sat there with weeds and became, you know, a place for Joe Canine to kill weeds, you know, his new post. But I don't think a lot of the staff wanted to be birthed on the base because it just cut right. their freedom even more. Right. Yeah. That was all, that's a whole other aspect of it. I agree. Do you remember about what time the, those buildings were built? What year? Well, when I had left in 2003, the shells were all there and they were, you know, some of the framing was done. They were, you know, in other words, the perimeter, what you see in the roofs were there. They didn't even have windows yet, most of them, but the building, it was basically there. We were still trying to figure out because I think I mentioned he lowered the building by three feet to yeah. save money, which then became an issue for the air conditioning units, which had been planned to work, you know, there's three levels. You can have them connected in three of them in line. But I don't know what, again, he had some idea that was going to save a lot of money. <laughs> let me let me ask you this, Jim, about the money, okay? Because I did, um, did you guys, to build these buildings, you had to get it out of existing income that came in? or Because they had, they had millions of dollars in reserves, but you guys couldn't build that. You're like right now, I, got, I know they buy all these buildings all over the world, and they're obviously using the Sea Org reserves for that. But like, that's what delayed these buildings being built, right? You had a hard time getting the money. Is that is that it was what a week by week FP out of in international finance? It was in finance, yeah. and it was based on flag for the you know the reality. Who was making the money was the F the flag service org, right? But again, that's also was the same pot that marketing and any other thing was going into. So we had to go week by week, which I always thought was stupid too. You know, I mean, I could buy up front. I got an approval, for example, to all the water pipe. Remember, we put in a whole new water system. Oh, yeah. That I had figured out. And I found the pipe in Utah. And it had like 17 trucks because I got a great 
price, but we, that was one week, you know, and then two to three weeks later when it finally arrived, then I'm trying to get okay to start installing it. You know what I mean? And we actually did most of that ourselves. And so guys, so. But uh, my point being, when I finally saw that they built these buildings, like you said, you left in 2003 or whatever, that was 13 years after initially those pads were built. So they were renting entire apartment complexes for 13 years. And that money could have been used. If they had just output some of the money to build the buildings, they would have saved tons of money. But yet, yeah. oh no, we're going to bit and piece it. You know, it's crazy. Or well, why even build them at all? Like you were saying, why not just live in town and save the money? Yeah. But that, that opens up a clue to his whole insanity. You know, I don't yeah. know. It's just... No, you're right. You're right. And then, like, like you said, even now, from what we've heard from people that are, that are that have left recently, most of these buildings, they've got them down to like their uh, the staff living in like one or maybe two of the buildings. The other ones are empty, and they're basically, you know, right now they're white elephants. They can't do anything with them. It's sure. just crazy. Yeah. See, I don't know what they're doing currently. I heard that they're just farming and they're hiring people, right? I guess I don't even know what to do there anymore. Anyway, then the next building, this is the uh, the movie studio, the Cine Studio Castle, which is humongous. I When I saw it the first time I drove by after I left, you know, years later, it's it's huge. And did you ha have a hand in that, too? Yeah, I did the whole planning for it, the architectural designing of what, you know, basically the space planning of what goes where. Barry, of mm -hmm. course, did the design at the time, um, you know, how it looks and what, you know, how to make it look like a castle. But we figured all that out, including, you know, this, well, the various city parts of it, like they wanted direct lighting, you know, not AC right. current, DC. So because they like to take set sound, they don't want to hear the crackle or distortion of sound. And how to do that with including, you know, we eventually chose that site because we found out that the place where it was originally supposed to go, which was directly south of Building 36, had a major seismic issue, you know. Right. Because during this whole time, we hired some really brilliant engineers to investigate the site because you got hills on one side, then you got this flat area, and we knew it was all the result of a lot of debris, you know, sand eons of time and washing in there. Um, in fact, doing one of the new wells, we ran into a redwood tree, believe it or not, 350 feet down. Wow. And, and yeah, <laughs> drilling, they ran into a redwood tree. At 350 wow. feet and basically those hills it keeps going in that steep slope so everything's built up you know this is where you get the, you know you get like quicksand if you get like even minor seismic events you know the water gets forced up and it's become very unstable so anyway, long and short of it was we moved it over there because we found by studying that area we're still close enough to the bedrock of the hill on the other side of the highway to mm -hmm. get support for it Does that make sense Absolutely. Now, let me ask you, at this point, building the studio, I don't, I doubt you built that with Sea Org labor, right? Was that mainly contractors that you guys contracted? Just again, the shell. The shell was, for the most part. In other words, oh, you mean like all the us, like the roofing and the stuff, you know, the siding and all that? Well, was all part of the shell. Members? In other words, the base, oh. the concrete, the footings, the slab, the wall, the perimeter walls, yeah. right? The roof. And then yeah. a lot of the other non-structural, the interior partition walls, painting, and a lot of that. And that's when Willett was in charge, because that's when I was sent. Right after we started, we were getting started, I went to the command teams. You remember the new era of management? Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, no, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, big stuff. Now, you weren't involved in this. The building up there in the front is the RTC, the Religious Technology Center building. That's okay. David Miscavige's building. It's empty, pretty much. And then up in the upper right, that's the new Bonnie View mega mansion that Miscavige spent millions of dollars okay. building. Here's a closer yeah. look at it here. Yeah. But uh, that's where the old Bonnie View used to be, which was just basically a one-story, three-bedroom house. Right, Jim? Yeah, very nice. And it was never part of his plan to have it just removed, destroyed, and bulldozed. He was talking, you know, I don't know if you guys have talked about Barry Stein before, but he had sort of a dual hat as a musician, as yeah. well as an architect, a totally trained architect. Hubbard had sent him a whole thing about creating, a, it was supposed to be a museum, and a hot, not here, not where this house was, because he used to stay there when he worked at the studio. Right. For days, he would stay in the old house. And I, I was in the RPF on one of my stints, and when I came out, that's when I, and I thought I'd heard they were building it and they got rid of the old, B, you know, what they call BV, Bonnie View. Right. 
And and Hubbard was totally happy with the old Bonnie view. Totally. It was not part yeah. of something he wanted. In fact, anyway. That's just, it's no, just, and then like like that whole that old Bonnie view. I mean, I, we talked about this off air, but I remember in 1982, 83, or whenever it was, um, you know, when we were getting the space ready for L. Ron Hubbard to come back, they found mold and mildew in the walls, yeah, and right. so the handling was lift the whole house on stilts, put down a new foundation and vapor barrier, get rid of the mold and mildew, then lower the house back down. I mean, it was tremendous work, and it and worked. You guys pulled it off. Yeah, and it worked. It worked. Yeah, so, I don't know, know that trouble. Would, I don't know why you would then bulldoze the house years later. That he's altering. Sense. As far as I can tell, that one thing he's altering it. He took yeah. that to mean, even though he says don't. It was a different location. He was talking about up on the hill. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you a quick question about Bonnie View. Remember the Japanese garden that was behind yeah. the old Bonnie View? Well, Is it still there, or did they did they get rid of it? Yeah, that I don't know. Because when I came back, okay. I was still a ne'er do well working in the states and. I never got behind there. I was just, you know, the only time I got up to the new RTC building was to mm -hmm. be called out by Dave about something. <laughs> yeah. So I never got it. I wasn't really running around the base like I used to, you know? No, listen, listen, just so our viewers know, Jim, Jim was a, an MVP on that property in regards to uh, building things. Steve Willett also, you know, had a lot to do with that too. But uh, you guys took a lot of crap from Miscavige unduly. You know what I mean? It's just just crazy stuff. I heard some crazy story from Mark Headley that you know when Miscavige he didn't like all the road noise going by, and that basically you guys had to stand outside every morning because it was waking him up. Is that true? True. Because you guys designed this road, which is by the way, it's part of California Highway yeah. seventy nine. <laughs> Yeah, he saw the plan, and it is what it is. It's just an engineer. They had to have certain radiuses. Now he wanted. If you want, and I don't know why it wasn't a problem earlier. Suddenly it was a problem. As I recall, there's a little bit of drop down time, which makes sense. And I do. Me and Will every morning. I used to. We had to get up early. We had to come in like 4 a.m. and stand out there for like three hours. And we still had to work a regular day, so we were getting about four to five hours sleep at that time too. No. Yeah, that was his punishment to you guys because you hadn't come up with a solution to the noise. Is that right? Yeah, he blamed us, not not the California State. It's part and, of Caltrain. What, Caltrain. what part of the property was this? The villas. The, the villas. Yeah. The villas. The villas. Oh, the villas. Yeah, you know how the backside of the villas, Janice, they were up the hill. There were grape orchards yes. there, but then the road there. was there. And DM lived on that side. Right. But yeah. he, because they couldn't close the road and all the trucks, there wasn't something happening. Oh, the buses from to the Indian Reservation casinos or something was waking him up. And so he was so pissed off about you guys not moving the road or having a solution that he made them stand well, I gave outside. Him a solution. I gave him a design yeah. for some walls that could have been stone veneer and they would have a yeah. certain angle and it would have knocked out 80 percent of it and it wouldn't have even been costly to make we could yeah. have done it on all hands on a sat couple saturdays but yeah he said oh that's gonna look horrible so then you know so he would present you a problem that was not solvable right the catch 22 catch 22 <laughs> absolutely you get used to that well okay this is gonna be typical same old same old you know i mean willard and i would just go and get coffee early in the morning and we'd sit out there for two hours and Talk sports, right? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, we'll go on to the next thing here. The next part of your story we want to tell is that L. Ron Hubbard's final home in Creston, California. L. Ron Hubbard died in January 1986. Nobody knew where he was until he died, except for a handful of people. And uh, Pat and Annie Broker were up there, as well as a few other people. And then uh, uh, when Hubbard died in 86, all of a sudden, uh, Pat and Annie were basically assumed to be in charge. And uh, uh, they, uh, Pat decided that they were going to continue to keep that property and do whatever it is that Hubbard wanted done to that property. And I was assigned the task to send a bunch of people up to the property. And Thanks, Jim was Mark. one of, the, yeah, that, yeah, you're welcome. And I felt really bad when you guys all came back or not you, but a bunch of them came back and had to go to the RPF. But anyway, yeah, I sent him, you, I mean, I remember Susie and Jason Benick, uh, Mike and Penny Eldridge, uh, uh, Bruno Marisi and Julie, Julie Marisi. Gelda went up, right, because Ray was up there. Is that right? Yeah, Ray was there already. Ray was there with that doctor from. Dr. Dent. Yes. Dr. Jean Dr. Dent, Dent, yeah. Uh, was there, and Ray was there when I and the other people arrived. Of course, Sarge was there, Steve Fowle, who had been there yeah. with Annie. He's kind of the not remembered personally he was there for all of this yeah you know, up there. exactly um anyway well, he, was, here, 
Sarge is the one who told me about DM and Pat sitting in the van together rewriting people's reports to Hubbard and taking things out. And, you know, they they totally altered things that were going up to Hubbard. It would have been like 82, 83 probably, right? Yeah. 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 Black van that was going between the cars. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, here's a map, okay? You can see the Int base over here on the right, okay? CST headquarters, that's up in the mountains, and that's where it's believed Shelly Miscavige is. And then Big Blue, of course, is in, is in Los Angeles. That's the, the old Cedars, Cedars of Hollywood Hospital. And then you see Creston way up there in, in the, uh, the left corner. It's near Paso Robles and San Luis Obispo, right? It's between right. those two towns. And it's in the middle of nowhere, isn't it? Pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it has a post office. It doesn't even have a store or gas station. At least it, I should say it did when we were there. It may now. You know, it mm-hmm. was just a couple of like literally four or five houses, no store. I think it might have had a, bo- a little bar, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was just a little post office. It was nothing. And then, of course, that's where L. Ron Hubbard was. And then Pat and Annie Broker were there. And we'll talk about them briefly shortly. And then this is an aerial view of the property. Um, and uh, I'll get in closer, but you can see on the left there, the, uh, the that was like a horse track, right? Where they could ride train horses. Right. And then later, like you said, those symbols in the middle are the Church of Spiritual Technology symbols that Hubbard wanted at all of their locations so that when he came back in a spaceship and was satellite, you know, orbiting the earth, he could see the properties and know where to go. And that's what those were for. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead to the next picture to be a little bit closer. That's another area of view. Now, these are recent photos. It didn't look like this back when you were there, correct? Well, it was pretty green. Depends on the time of year. So you're like, that's in yeah. summer. In January, yeah, so January it, it would dry good. out. It would dry yeah. out. Oh, yeah. A lot of that area now is instead of cattle ranches, which when we were there is what it was. Now it's vineyards. Paso Robles uh, gets a lot of that marine layer, and the hills are great for it. Like, you probably can find Paso Robles one now. Okay, and just describe what this building is, because this is the building where Elrond Hubbard's Bluebird mobile home or whatever bus was was right. uh, parked, and that's where he actually ended up dying. He was living in there, and that's where he died in his bus right here at this location. Yeah. What is that build? What is that building? That's the stables, and that's where all the horses. You know, again, Pat, when we were there, was had all kinds of horses and was moving them between two other this place and another. So we took care of the horses there. We also had a chicken coop and a turkey coop, which looks like that's all been removed. Um, We had buffaloes on the hill that this was taken from. If you're up there, that's where they used to have four buffalo, and then Pat got four more. No, eight more. So we had 12 buffalo up there. Wow. I mean, Pat's a whole story in himself. But um, Why were all those animals there in the first place? Were they just there just to be there? Annie herself had told me when he was there, he used them for research. Specifically, there was one horse he used, and he only had two horses there. The other horses uh-huh. to keep the one there. So by the time, literally just a matter of a few weeks, it went from two horses to like 18 horses. Um, and Pat was, again, he's like his own, I don't know what he, you know, he really thought it was Bonanza, man. He was just taking, bringing horses and doing the thing, you know. Um the buffalo, I think he had four of them. He had named the horse, you know, the buffalo, like Hitchcock was one, you know, gave him Western names. But yeah, then they brought in eight more. I, I don't know what the buffalo were for. She only told me about some research he had done with the horses, but specifically there was only one horse he was really interested in. It was a really nice, gentle mare when I arrived. Yeah, that's the house. That's the main house, right? Yeah. And How it had a swimming pool. How far had they been in the renovations when you got there? It was pretty much done. So do you yeah, know we where ate all our meals? We ate all our meals on the first floor. It's like a bide level. Right. Mm-hmm. Is he had a really nice, you know, what wasn't done was the second floor in terms of finishes, right? Right. They had a carpenter that Pat got. It was like oak and mahogany and really expensive stuff. And I didn't understand that. Well, I remember hearing stories yeah. just like those. Those white fences, yeah. I heard stories about how Hubbard would look down the line. If they weren't straight, he would have them take them down and put them back up. Was that true or things like that? Or he was no? already gone by then, but I met the guy. All those guys you heard about in that original thing, like the guy with the camera, and yeah. how he showed how to use it, the guy in charge of the fences, and even the guys that did the fences. I, I started to run them for a while. Mainly, it was just painting. 
the way he had it, you had to paint them. So once you finished painting all this fencing, because the whole perimeter's got it too, you then had to restart again. So there's these two. Because it wore, because it weathered, it all would weather. Yeah, it would. <laughs> um, That's crazy. But I don't know about that because that was, oh yeah, and these three things, this was a huge problem to Norman and Dave, these three things Pat had us build and set up. You're talking about we were all living in trailers originally down here around, yeah. around that. The actual thing that how Hubbard was in at the end was a, was an avion, you know, those silver ones. He wasn't uh -huh. in the bluebird then. He was living in there in that little avion, which is right at the end. You're right. It's right next to where those buildings were. And so this was for us. And they were really nice too, you know. I mean, you're talking about the, up here at the top. Yeah, the those three, right? those right three were just pulled in double wide trailer homes. You put them together, and we were allowed to just make them really nice, you know. So you said David Norman had problems with it because you're spending. Yeah, because that money was all. Everything we were doing was coming out of the fund, you know, the, the trust, the yeah. LH's trust, which was to convey. And what you know, again, David and that was good, I was going to mention this one thing earlier when I said the day that I arrived, everything kind of went into a yeah. confusion. Go ahead. They would not talk to me after that. Then when they came up, they were totally differential to Annie and Pat because yeah. And you know, I kept trying to pull them aside. Hey, this is what they're telling us to do. Should we be doing this? Because you know, you told me when we started all this, we're part of the estate and we're supposed to be, you know, financially responsible to you to not just be wasting all this money, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> the day that I arrived, Annie took me aside. You have to realize the first time I'm meeting her, who in the household unit we knew as a senior messenger, right. And she, she said, she, the first thing she asks me, I mean, she's very polite, but you know, she's wearing her sunglasses, and even though it's kind of cloudy out, she says, what did they tell you your job is? And they said, uh, and I explained exactly what Norman and J Dave told me about the fiscal responsibility and that, you know, I work under Norman because that was totally crystal clear. Yeah. Okay, the first thing she says is that, you know, she just started screaming not screaming, not, you know, she was very angry. She says, no, that is not your job. That is not what you're to do. I'm your boss, you know, and just, then she went on a roll by ASI in her mind with to how they were dealing with the financial stuff and the court cases were keeping Hubbard from going back, redoing the films, finishing the ones he didn't get to do. She was just livid. And of course that, that is all something I knew nothing about. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, right. He made it clear that I was not to listen to anything they were saying. So, yeah, you were caught in the middle. Same thing <laughs> happened to me. Same thing happened to me as corporate liaison officer working for DM was because Annie and Pat, Annie was over RTC, Religious Technology Center, and, right. she, and Vicki Asnoran answered to Annie and right. not David, right? right? So he would tell me, don't do anything Vicki says, don't do anything Jesse Prince says, you know what I mean? And you're kind of going like, what happened? Oh, if Pat Broker comes on the property, you know, don't listen to him. And you probably felt the same way, right? So then oh. when David Norman would come up to the ranch, they just gave you the cold shoulder because they didn't want to say anything to you, right? And a couple of times later, again, they would come up maybe once every two months. <clears throat> Norman did, when he saw those, it seemed like that was the first time they'd seen him. We were, you know, those trailers, right? Mm -hmm. And Norman pulls me aside saying, what are you doing? But he takes me so nobody else can hear, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you know? <laughs> hey, I'll pull them out of here. You know, you just tell me, you just give me your word, you know? And they said, no, no, don't do that. Because I could, I could just call them and come, get them out of here. We can save, we don't have to do any of the interiors, you know, save something. Yeah, and There's, just so our viewers to know, what? for our viewers to know, this was the beginning of the power structure to take over Scientology after right. I right. died. OK, this was the beginnings of it up at the Creston Ranch. OK. Right. And, uh, you know, the, 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 they were they were maneuvering around each other. And people like Jim and the people that I sent up there to work up there, they were pawns in this thing, you know, and they got caught up in it. Right. Oh, everybody. I mean, <laughs> Susie Bennett, who was the comm center in charge at that point, she had been as earlier than I had, like since 1980, 81, 82. Yeah. She was up there. She couldn't figure out what the heck. She had been dealing directly with Annie through the comm stuff and only Pat peripherally as a courier is how she put it to me. You know what I mean? It wasn't really, he wasn't like the mind or he wasn't the, uh, 
Yeah, that's what I heard afterwards yeah. too, that Pat, LRH had actually kicked Pat off of Creston and told him not to come back until he had an all clear. Right. And so yeah. then he, he was hanging out at uh, whatever, the uh, in Newberry Springs, right? You guys had yeah, the Devore. There. Devore was the other place. There's a little trailer park. That was one of the- I other know, places. Devore. That's where Sinar was for a while. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And so was uh, JB would kind of go in yeah. between those places. Yeah. And uh, so so what, what was your relationship or what was your interactions with Pat? Was he in and out, not there, or what was going on then? Well, he was to, he was sort of doing a different version of the musical chairs that Dave was doing at the base. Uh -huh. Pat would take people on the, and he'd make you think it was like James Bond or some secret thing. Like he would take, yeah. like in the middle of the night, he would show up unannounced and he'd bring off a couple of trade, you know, horses. Usually, go usually with a gun, sleep. usually with a gun in his car or, <laughs> yeah. or a truck. And he was just taking horses to horse shows, you know? Yeah. Um, but he always had this, uh, trying to create like, I don't know, a fiction, you know, like literally he was, I think he did think he was sort of a James Bond type dude. So anyway, my point was I was the only one, I wouldn't go with him. You know, you even say, I said, no, I need to stay here because I learned how to take care of all these animals, all these creatures, the swans and everything. I knew I was the only one that knew how to take care of all the horses and everything. Because he kept what was, your, what was your post there? Were you the ranch manager or what were yeah, you doing? Called, I mean, I was called the CEO, the commanding officer, uh -huh. but it's like, I'm just yeah. a foreman. That was it, you know, and but then what did the other people do? Like, what did Jason, Susie, Mike Eldridge, what all did they do? Well, I started by putting together an organizing chart, like organizing. I put, I gave everybody yeah. a thing. You know, we had Mike Eldridge and Gelda. They were going to be qualifications for training and do supervision, auditing as necessary. And I had this whole thing laid out. And um, Pat <laughs> we weren't doing that, you know. So yeah. your guess is as good as mine. He would take, you know – Center over here, and he would send Mike some tech thing, and he would stay up all night with Pat about something. And you know, I, I tried to keep people doing it. It's one that in the end, just by default, I knew every job because sometimes the guy wasn't there that was supposed to do it. So that's I, and that was fine with me. I didn't want to go up, you know, I, I just thought the guy was a little touched, you know, it's an old term, I think, 1800s term, you know what I mean by touch? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had, he was a little out. Little Something out was missing. Yeah. Now, I, I know. he could be very nice. Don't get me wrong. And he had a good sense of humor, but he could go off on these uh, fan, fanciful things. I didn't know what was real or unreal. And I just kind of went, put all of it in the, unless I've seen it, it's probably not true, you know? Right. I have a question. When, um, after DM went and did the bus and everything, what I was told. And by Dave himself, he said that you guys were all up there drinking away. Pat was a drunk, and that you guys, instead of studying, would be sitting around drinking. Do you well, know anything about that? Well, that's what he did at night with the two tax people. That the <laughs> attorney that you see in all those things, she was there as the tax person. Oh, Monique Yingling. Monique Yingling. Yes. Oh, You're yeah. I'm just they saying. would stay up all night and drink. But to get to that point on us, yes, eventually I had people we'd go to study. We had classes and you know we did all that. But it deteriorated after a while. Again, I have a, I have a question. So yeah. when the tax attorneys and DM and Norman came up there, did yeah. they live in the house? Did they live in Hubbard's house? Is that yeah. where they stayed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they there's... stayed in there and, and Pat eventually moved into the house, you know, the room that we were renovating for Hubbard. Right. That tells you a lot of, like, that was his kind of, like, you know. Yeah. His rep. How, was, how tight were Pat and Annie? Well, not in my mind. Again, just watching yeah. them together. They didn't yeah. really seem um, lovebirds. <laughs> I mean, they didn't seem yeah. that. They, they, they were cordial. I, they, I never saw them fight yeah. or anything, but he was always, you know, they'd always kind of be in opposite places. You know what I mean? He would mm -hmm. eat, and sometimes he would eat with us very rarely if he was even there. But, you know, she was the one that kind of was always there too. Like me, yeah. just trying to keep, you know, I don't even know what she was doing. Oh, she was doing under Ray, was getting some auditing, was supposed to finish. I think she was in the middle of OT one or two one of those levels, which was what Bray told me. He was there trying to get her through that area that's considered a danger zone for. Yeah, I thought she was, um, 
had been on OT3 and the LRH had been case supervising her on that. She had just started OT3 is what I was okay. told by Ray. And yes, he had been doing those first ones with her. But when he departed, that's when he wanted Ray to get her through it. Okay. That's what I understood. That's why and Ray. What ha sorry. I'm sorry. And then how did it, how did it all end for you there at the Creston Ranch? How did you end up back at gold, uh, you know, doing the, uh, uh, Self-sufficiency, self yeah. Well, again, there was about half of us, about 10 of us, like Jason and me and Susie and Herb and Matt Markowitz and Gelda and Mike Eldridge. We all went in an earlier thing. We were supposed to implement it and start it there. And Dave told me that when he had come up as part of that. <clears throat> I mean, all that was pretty civil. We just went back and we were working under him in the corporate liaison in charge. Again, it was Todd Alexander. Right, it was Todd. Yeah. yeah, and I but, put but, together a but, I mean, when, but what were you guys told as to why you were leaving Creston? What happened? We weren't really told, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We were, they were downsizing and things had changed. I remember something about the whole point we were there was this interim period for the will to make it through the attorneys and all that and then do that. So somebody else may know, but we didn't get told any, you know, we had no, you know, reality factor you know i you know someone fill in the blank of vacuum of information other yeah. than i know they were saying that there, there was a change or things were about to be okay so we didn't have to have everybody up there and then of course dm took over and got rid of pat and annie and uh, the rest yeah. of history from there well that was happening yeah. even near the end while we were up there i remember getting a call from mike sutter <clears throat> saying hey you know i hadn't talked to sutter for <laughs> for a long time warning yeah. me that Jesse Prince and some people were coming up and don't let them in, you know, just be aware that these guys are coming up there. I never saw them. Apparently they did. Wait a minute. Mike, Mike Sutter said, don't let them in. Yes. Like it was danger. You know, they're, they're trying to take over. That's how Sutter put it. Okay. But Sutter was working for VA and Jesse. <laughs> oh, oh, you're right. He said that they look, they're coming up there. And then the next call I got was from Bloomfield, the big uh, Aussie gentleman. Dave, yeah, Bloomberg. Dave Bloomberg. Yeah, Bloomberg, he was yeah. the one that told me that they were uh, they're trying to take over. Their, you know, I, I think so. Well, I, I, th I think a lot of it had to do, Jim, with yeah. the L. Ron Hubbard, you know, his research files, his yes. auditing folders, because, you know, I've read since then Marty's book and other books about how they got private investigations because they were trying to find out where Pat – and Annie had them hidden. Okay. Yeah, they were in the Abbey when, trailer. Yeah. And then when they found out where they were at, then they wanted to get them out. So so the the the, the subterfuge was Pat and DM went to Washington, DC to you know, work on tax stuff. And right. then they sent in the PIs and stuff to get it because I got a phone call late at night, like two in the morning, at mm -hmm. the gold base from DM telling me, Hey Mark. Norman and Marty are going to be here with a truck and you need to open up the LRH safe room, let them in, change the locks and don't let anybody in. And he goes, I don't care if Pat broker, Annie broker, anybody says anything, just don't let them in. Uh, and that was when they got Hubbard's folders, which was supposedly the upper level OT levels. And that's, that's how, and then once they had those, then they could go after Pat and kick him out. And then I don't know how they crushed Annie, but they yeah. did somehow. Well, again, at that point, <clears throat> we were not, you know, we were in our little circle. We were just doing cowboy stuff and taking care of the animals. So that was the only, <laughs> I got those two calls. So that's all I knew. And then as yeah. I came back, I find out all this other, that's when I first find out about all this takeover stuff, you know. And yeah. Spike was involved. And I mean, it's sort of like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> what the heck? So you know more about it than I do. I think even a No, but I, but it's interesting from your point of view, because I have never talked to anybody who was up there at that time. You know, I mean, yeah. I remember when you guys all came back, nobody ever talked about it. You know, Jason, oh. Jason worked for me for like five years, you know, and yeah. he came back and he was in the RPF and then, you know, he was in gold. You know, I just never we never talked about it. Yeah. My my thought was that the actual takeover didn't happen for a year later when the second group, including Annie, was to go to the RPF. Yeah. Uh, we set up all the RPF for these guys, because at that point. I had finished self sufficiency. It was now in the states. Sorry, I'm losing right. my rules. No, that's okay. Oh, sorry. 
Okay, great. Uh, anyway, yeah, let's, Amy, let's go. Amy made a comment saying uh, they sent Annie to the RPF because Amy was on the RPF with her. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They sent Amy. I'm sorry, they sent Annie, and then they, all, all that second group. There was a you know, there's several others. I, I'm trying to remember the. I remember the ones that I came back with, but I don't remember all the others. You know. Yeah, and then Annie was basically a kept person at the base to the day she died from what i understand i mean uh miscavige had something on her because he they would go off and talk when she was at the base and all that he always was keeping an eye on her and all that but right you know she she wasn't when i was there i know i heard later she became an executive again but she worked she at, came in charge know, of the, she worked with ted horner in the dark room when i was there right. you know what i mean right yeah she was later made in charge of the messenger unit for the base, the SU unit. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, she was an interesting person. I mean, I David, I think I told you about the bag of LRH's signed things, yeah. just like trash that I ended up giving to her. Right, yep. Four bags of all his notes, you know, that said yeah. everything he was trying to do up there, why we're painting fences white, the name of the ranch, and all this. So I recognized his handwriting from the mission I did with Jim Isaacson. In 1984, right. we went to D.C., Right. The first originals mission to recover. We even found like four original tapes that nobody had seen in the light of day. But so I knew I learned to learn. I knew it is. I knew quite well his handwriting. But you never found out who put all those devices in those bags in the trash bags. Annie blamed Sarge. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and she was really thankful. Well, and she's probably right because I mean I don't know how they organize things, but really it was just two people. Sarge was taking care of trash and shredding and all this, and it was in these other bags. There was like a bunch right. of bags. And I mean, that's what we were going I just happened to open up them and look at it because I wasn't going to just throw stuff away if I didn't know what it was. At least, you know, just see what it was. And I kept, I found like three bags with notes, you know, from him. Um, but she was really appreciative of it. That's when she swore under her breath to Sarge. But I, I'd observed enough being there that Sarge was kind of doing a lot of the labor and pick up this and that, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, because and before he went and, there, he was the one that was taking care of the horses and the stables. He was doing everything, yeah. Yeah, and he said and, LRA and, used to come and talk to him in the stables and visit the horses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But and then poor Annie had to take care of Hubbard until he died. You know what I mean? Right. It was just her. Didn't she cook for him and took care of him and all that? I mean, yeah. know, it was just her and Sarge. That was it. Yeah, I mean, she was okay. She didn't, I didn't want to give a bad impression of her there because I was. No, just I liked. I loved action. Annie. Yeah. He just went at all, but then yeah. I think she realized that all this had been thrown in one stall, like that, where you see all those horse stalls in the stables. It was all in one yeah. thing. It was all kind. Of, a lot of it was trash. It was whatever, and I think it just got mixed in. You know. Yeah. Okay, Janice, I'm going to go ahead and go to questions now. We got some questions. Oh, yeah, and and, uh, and if we want to bring that. Amy on, Amy's Amy's available. If we want to bring her on to to chat with us, I would like to. Except I got to let's get to the questions here first, okay. and then we can you know bring her on. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. So I just oh, okay. go ahead and do that. Not I love I love Amy, and I'd love to have her on here. Anyway, um, we got a couple things. Okay, a couple things we got to acknowledge. Uh, we have a new couple new members, Joni Cummings. Thank you very much for becoming a member. And then we have another member here, which is Edgar Snorri Olofsson. Thanks very much for becoming a member of our channel. We appreciate it. If anybody's interested in becoming a member, go to our homepage, click on that join button, follow the instructions on either a computer or laptop or Android phone. Uh, if you have an iPhone, you have to go through Google Chrome to go to YouTube, then go to our page and click on that join button. And we appreciate these new members. Uh, we also got a super sticker from Clearwater Chad. Thanks very much, Clearwater Chad. And I'm going to start going through these questions. Tori Christman's in the house. Uh, Jim, I bet Hubbard got tons of gifts. Can mm -hmm. you tell us where they generally went? That was yeah, probably when you were in the household unit. Yeah, yeah, he would get a lot. Um, we would send photos of each one, and then we'd get requests, and certain ones would go to him. You know, he would ask for them, and quite often, most of them, he would there'd be an indication of where they went. Now, some of them were in his handwriting. Some, I think, were from Annie. Just how oh, put this mm -hmm. in the library, put this in this place, and <clears throat> that was then what I was supposed to do is to make sure that those things were done. I just couldn't figure out what car he wanted the Longhorns on. I think. Uh, I, okay. And I know on the ship when he'd get all these gifts, a lot just went into storage. Yes, he had nowhere to put them. Yeah, to answer your question, Tori, that's the other thing. We had like five containers 
40 foot by 10, you know, with eight by <laughs> 10 by 40, five of them filled with things. Yeah. And then, and then I heard after we left that, oh, you got to collect money for David Miscavige's birthday gift. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, we used to do that for L. Ron Hubbard, but I don't ever remember doing that for DM. No. You know, that was crazy. Anyway, next, uh, we've got another member too, Danielle Chamberlain. Thank you so much. You're now a member and, and we appreciate everything you and Neville do, Danielle. Thank you so much for that, for joining our channel. And we've got uh, Tori Christman again. Jim, did they actually kick you out? I ask as now they lie and say that about anyone who leaves or escapes out. Oh, yeah, I mean, I was on my way. Like I said, I was in the RPS, RPS, RPS for a while. And we were, you know, I was trying to figure out how to get out, you know, for the last part. Were you, were you part of that big exodus where they basically offloaded a bunch of people and gave yeah, them I was like kind of the first. Bucks? Yeah, that was kind of the first wave of that. That's crazy. I remember Neil, Neil Bogart, Neil Smed. That's how I met her, you know, after she got out. She well, said, oh, yeah, they, they moved everybody to L.A. And then next thing you know, they were just kicking people out left and right. Yeah, I think we were sort of the pilot for the test cases. Yeah. There was a group of us. Joe Kinnean, I think I mentioned he was there, the mm -hmm. former cameraman. And all these yeah, guys. they a lot of old timers. They, didn't they get rid of Jeff Hawkins that way, too? Yeah. Jeff and I yeah. left at the same time. <laughs> yeah, Je Jeff, the guy who got Dianetics on the New York Times bestseller list and sold millions of copies. Oh, yeah, we're just going to kick you out. Yeah, he's <laughs> doing the wrong thing. <laughs> All right, next question here. Vernon Salvatierra, question mark. Did Jim ever work with Mike Rinder? Yes. Briefly. I mean, most of, we were in the same area. Yeah. I, he also, he stayed with us in Virginia when he left for a few oh, months. That, that's right. He stayed with our, in our place for a, a little, for a while. Um, oh yeah, 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 that's right. So. Okay, great. But I mean, I've that's known him, we're always, because, you know, yeah. I really through Amy, because Amy worked in the same organizations that. Right. Render tended to. I would and see. Jan, him and Amy, Jan, 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 Amy worked with you and vice versa, right? Jan? Yes. Yeah, Amy and I were very close. Oh. When she got married to Jim, that's why I was in the wedding. Right. <laughs> I I couldn't, when I saw those photos, I can't remember why I wouldn't have been at the wedding because it was on the ship and I, I probably was doing something else because I always was at the base. I don't have no idea when that was. Pretty wild. Yeah. It was in okay. June of 87. And that was after you could return from Creston, right? After yeah. you returned from the ranch, right? Yeah. Okay. And then this person, uh, same question. Did Jim, did you ever meet L. Ron Hubbard? No, not face to face. I got a couple messages from him written, yeah. but no, never did. Yep. Okay. Next question, Rosemary. Who is the biggest narcissist, DM or L. Ron Hubbard? Well, having only met one of them, <laughs> I would have to say DM. He's got, he sets a pretty high bar. Janice has met only me. I can't both. say about the other. Oh, who knows? I mean, you have to always clap at his photo all the time. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Janice has met them both. So why don't you answer this? Yeah, I, I would give DM the, the award. Yeah. yeah, me too. Me too. I mean, I, I never met Hubbard either, but I mean, based on how I know he lived his life and all that when we were in the Sea Org, yeah, Miscavige is taking it to a crazy level. And that's not my dog. That's Jim's dog, right, Janice? Right. Mine, mine are looking up. They're like, where's the dog? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here we go here. Colleen's reviews and stories. Hey, everyone. Just got here getting ready to do some grilling for dinner in Michigan. I have a question. Is this the compound where Shelly is, meaning Crest? No. No. No, it's not. Yeah, I don't and they know. still have that ranch. I have no idea. what. The, I think they're just maintaining it. I have no idea what they use it for. Well, just like all the other homes that LRH used to live in, they bought those all up. What a waste of money. And I know Hubbard would agree with that. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's typical, though, when you mentioned DM and the lawyers were the ones drinking it up. Yeah, he always accused people of stuff like that. I remember that he said the same thing to me about Pat and, every, and Jason and everybody up there. We're all just being drunks all the time. It's just crazy. Yeah. Well, no, I think we were. I did confirm with JB, John Brousseau, that Pat was heavily drinking 
when he was at um, Newberry. Well, he yeah, but he wasn't at, he wasn't he at was at Newberry. Yeah, he wasn't at Creston. No, but he was drinking at Creston. In fact, I had oh, got okay. woken up in the middle of the night to take him to the hospital with Annie and Mike Rinder, or not Mike Rinder, Mike uh, Eldridge and um, Ray. I could smell the booze. He just, he had, what happened was apparently he fell <laughs> and he hurt himself and then he was going into this tangent about OT3 information while I'm in the back and I'm the only non-OT there, you know, like, what's yeah. he talking about, you know? So he, yo, yeah, he was a, he was very, he liked his whiskey. Yeah. Okay. Next question is here. So where's my, I lost my mouse. One sec here. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Next question is from Love for Kitchen. Every single episode of this channel is more fascinating than the last. Honestly, this is such a history lesson. No other channel is doing content like this. I'm absolutely engrossed in the stories. Well, thank you, Love for Kitchen. We appreciate you watching and everybody else that is here. Uh, next question is from Vernon again. Janice, did David Miscavige think Hubbard was mentally and physically ill towards the end of his life? Uh, I, I know the answer to that question. Yes, he did. You go ahead, Mark. No, he did. I mean, and, and it was true. I mean, we found this out after the fact, but Hubbard had had several strokes. And Jane, uh, Dr. Gene Dank was up there right. taking care of him at different times. And uh, he was not in good health. You know, And I think yeah. that's one of the reasons why Miscavige moved and saw an opportunity to move and take over because he knew that Hubbard was weak. And, uh, you know, anyway, what are you saying, Janice and Jim? Jim? Well, he definitely looked overweight and not in good health. I know that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You say he was overweight because what I had heard, and I think it was Annie that told me, um, he'd actually, well, he couldn't eat a lot of food so he ended up going on a diet of just apple juice. Oh, and really? From that, he actually shrunk down and was very small and petite uh, in the later years. Wow. Hmm. Okay. Next question here. Vernon's again. And Mark and Janice, did the hole exist when both of you were still Scientologists? No. That no. happened well after we were gone. Yeah, and we heard all that stuff when Amy got out, you know. I mean, that's when the first time I heard about the musical chairs and incident and all that other stuff, and it, I, it floored me, you know. I couldn't believe it. Next question, uh, Peace Dog. Tori Chrisman, did you hang with Mark and Janice when you were in? Is that to... Uh, that's oh, to no, Jim. It must be through Jim. Yeah, I mean, we knew each other. I mean, Jim and I worked together. We played basketball. I know that. Yeah, and Janice, I did. You mentioned she was, in, like, senior or whatever in that period just when lrh departed i was the head of the hu and she was the deputy senior messenger so she was all over the hu yeah. so that was probably the time i got to work with you the closest yeah i think so yep because i'd go up there every day and do inspections and we'd chat and go over things yeah. yep all right next question is for me uh, Vernon, uh, Mark, what happened uh, to your wife after you left? Did she get remarried? Is she still a Scientologist? Uh, Jim, you'd know better than me, but I heard that she got remarried to Peter Schles. Is that right? Yes, I've heard that too. Yeah, but that's all yeah. I know. I don't. I mean, yeah, and she's still in. Know, that's a few years ago. So. Yeah, but she's still in, and uh, she's been. You know, she's like Shelley Miscavige. She went to the ship when she was twelve or thirteen or fourteen yeah. or whatever. And that's all the life she ever knew. And they turned her against me. I mean, I came back twice after blowing specifically because I didn't want to leave her, but they turned her against me like quickly. I mean, we've been, we've been together for almost seven years and, you know, and, and she didn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. So it was kind of like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to move on then. You know, thanks for that question. Here's one for Janice. What kind of vitamins do you sell in your business? Oh, I sell pretty much the, the regular basic vitamins, A, D, B, C, you know, all that kind of stuff. CalMag, Calm. Uh, you can yeah. go to www.vites.com and you can see it all there. There it goes. There it's on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> and Thank she's you got for asking. Calm. She's got Koala Calm, right, Janice? Yes, I have Koala Calm. Somebody came up with an idea yesterday for our logo to be a koala bear in a Hawaiian shirt. And I, we like that idea. <laughs> All right, here, let's go. We've got a few more questions here. Um, in the wrong place. Not 
here we go. Okay, this is from YouTube Watcher. Does Scientology management prefer any construction or architecture style? Jim? Well, at the base, Hubbard had set a Scottish motif, which is where the white and the blue roofs come in, this slate type of thing. So that kind of set the style for that location. Um, I can't speak to any other one. Um, no, it actually looked good. I liked I liked the way it looked. I don't know about you, Jim. Hmm. Had the stone veneer underneath and all that. The yeah, dark mahogany, dark wood. Good. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what this is from Care Force JC. I drive by there for years, and it wasn't till I saw a stream from above did I realize how big the property is. All you saw was next to the road and all the derelict houses they finally tore down. That's uh, the gold base. Uh, were you there when they tore, tore down the houses on sub? No, no, no. Sublet Road, they bought the yeah. houses. But, but oh, they I didn't tore know down they bought everything down there. Really? Yeah, they broke the oh, yeah, several yeah, yeah, houses, yeah. and then they, they put some people in there, and I think that's where the Headleys blew from. Yeah. But then they end up tearing them all down. All these perfectly yeah, good houses because DM didn't want them there. Hey, uh, that reminds me, Jim, were you involved in the golf course? Uh, yeah. you know, when we, we did the golf course, right? Yeah, I hired the guy to do the design of it and built it. Yeah. Right. yeah, just so everybody knows that, uh, you know, that originally the Gilman Hot Springs had like 36 whole golf course and then it all went to crap, you know, and we had it and the, the, the neighbors lived on this road called Sublet Road that lined the fairways and they were all pissed off because they bought homes with a golf course and they were no longer there. So to handle the public relations problem after all these years, we built a nine hole golf course down at their end of the property. And that's, that's what I was asking Jim about. Yeah, correct. And I think and it's that still how, there. Right. That's how we got approval to do the whole development of the base was by putting that there. Yeah. Because but, the city council was upset that there was no golf course for the, for the tent. Riverside the County actually. Yeah. I actually okay. presented to the Riverside County, this whole marketing thing showing the golf course, but then also the, everything we were going to do. And that was sort yep. of the ticket because we had five members and uh, we weren't going to get it unless we did something that was considered good for the community, you know, beyond what we were going to do with the highway or you know, Caltrans, the highway that Dave hated because it kept him up all night later. Um, those are all part of the uh, agreement. Okay. Next question. Amy Here's says, one. Mark, Amy says yeah. they tore down those houses because you could see into DM's office from there. Oh, that would make so much to be. It would be consistent for him to say that. I don't. I don't doubt it. <laughs> yeah. Also, Jim, did you build the tunnel under the road? Yeah, we built there for that. Yeah, we built. Yeah, it. I wasn't there. That was after we left. Yeah, that yeah. must have been a headache. <laughs> yeah, it's actually pretty. Yeah, you know, because we had to shut it down and we can go yeah. over it one at a time. But Caltrans has pretty good in construction standards. We had two inch rebar. Mm -hmm eight and 10 inch spacings and those footings you could people can see them they have stone on them now but that's how big the footings are i mean those things aren't going anywhere it's safe to go under there <laughs> yeah uh question how much was the weekly salary for you all while before you left for me, well, it, was me it was like 50 most of the time i was it was 35 dollars when i when i left you know well, well, i was always on half pay or no pay so that it was about 12 50 i was always on half pay for Seventeen dollars always sticks in my mind. <laughs> well, it was seventeen twenty when I first joined the Sea Org, and you got okay. two dimes taped to the invoice with seventeen dollars. It was the stupidest thing. The twenty cents, you know, was ridiculous. Next question, Dana Perry: Is that where all the DVDs they sent me are recorded? The trailer things. Um, yeah, well, the DVDs and all that stuff was produced there at the Gold Gold property in the manufacturing building, right? Uh, but he he put that question up, I think, when we were talking about the castle. Well, that's yeah, where that's they shot the movies. movies. Yeah, that's where they're. But you have all these other facilities. There's the film lab. There's an editing area. Like all those steps, you have the music, recording. You know, there's all kinds of things that go into it. Yeah. In and the castle, too. I see Mitch that's Brister on here. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, Mitch! He great. said to say hello. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you were close to Mitch. You knew Mitch. Well, I was in a lot of movies, and you know, I I kept trying oh. not to screw him up for him a lot, you know, because I, I would do you know I was in little things here and there, but yeah, and then late, you know, I, I really liked him. I'm, I'm 
that's a name I hadn't heard for a while. I hope he's. Uh, yeah, we did some interviews with him. He's great. Oh, he and of course, they probably yeah. had to reach. Yeah, they probably had to reshoot the movies because after you leave, oh, sure. they go, "Oh, we can't can't have Jim in there." No, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, no. We did two or three interviews with them. You should watch on our right. channel. They're really good. Uh, Peace Dog says, so that's where Mark Headley spent his days working, talking about the castle. Yes, that is correct. And also the manufacturing, what we call Building 36. Uh, Mark Headley worked in there as well. Right. Next, wow. uh, I think these days they only make new films in L.A., if I recall correctly, Mark told us that. Yeah, I don't know. I think Mitch Yeah, that's what I've heard. That new studio well, that they, they purchased down there. Well... No, remember Mitch told us that that broadcast center is where they do all the stuff for the TV channel, but that yeah. the gold that they, he said they're reshooting all the technical films again at the gold base. So who knows? Oh. Yeah, that's what's going on with that. Uh, and I answered that question about tunnel under the road. Here we go. Uh, this is from Vera Vernon again. Did Dave Miscavige ever hit women in the Sea Org? I never saw him hit, but. I heard stories about him making Larice do things to people. Well, did you ever did you ever see DM other than you said you saw me getting hit beat up? Did you see other acts of violence by DM? Me? Heck yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you one. Like you meant to start with the woman, Sarah. Oh, he hit oh, Sarah? Sarah. Okay, go well, ahead. He did. He, so go ahead. he got in her face, and even his spittle was doing that. You know, like I considered that a violent. Yes. Thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and Sarah's like the sweetest, nicest person in the freaking world, you know? You can't get sweeter than Sarah. <laughs> I mean, but anyway, no, you know, I was thinking about another, again, after Creston, Jason was with me and he got audited up there by Gelda. So it's almost two years later. This is after the point when Dave's taken over and it's actually in this place you call the hole, right? Those trailers we yeah. put up when we were renovating for Qual, the, you know, the auditing rooms. I was sitting in the back, and I, Jason is up there, all the RTC people there. Dave puts a headlock on Jason and starts telling him, telling everybody how bad he is because he, he's giving up a confidential information from a session. Because I remembered it because Gelda was auditing him, right? Like he had bad thoughts about Dave, or, you know, he's, he's just, literally. It was like that, you know, and I know you all, this isn't new to other people that you've, you've heard, you know, but I remember looking around the room going, is anybody else seeing this crap? Like this is completely 1000% wrong, you know? Uh, right. Yeah. The first time I ever saw, first time I ever saw DM do something like that was like probably 84 or something. And we were in his office mm -hmm. and Eric Newton was in there with me and Jason and Jason made some kind of comment. I don't know that, Miscavige hated he went across his desk and grabbed Jason around the throat and Shelly and I both jumped up and said Dave Dave stop you know what I mean it's like you know you're gonna stop something like that that's not what we were there for you know so when after I got beat up and all that I went that's it for me I mean this is not the Scientology I was raised on you, you know you know what I and I'm sorry I just noticed Amy said something about Dion putting his hands around her neck and now when she says that I kind of recall her telling me about that. That was, uh. in fact, I think he had, I could, she showed me the red mark, like the red. Uh, wow. He's a freaking yeah. whack job, man. Sociopath. Okay, next question. What's he we have doing here. now? Does anybody know that? Hiding. What he's doing? <laughs> yeah, like, what, I mean, is he around? Like, is he still. Well, the, the rumor is he's in Clearwater and he's basically avoiding service from the different lawsuits and stuff that are going on. Um, but I don't know what he's doing, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, he, you know, Mitch Brisker told us that he, he said he was never going back to the Gold Base. And when Mitch was there, he said he hadn't been, Miscavige hadn't been back to the Gold Base from, since like 2013 or 2014, mm -hmm. something like that. You know? Yeah, because Dave thinks they're all SPs up there. Yeah, that's what yeah, Mitch well, he said. He would know, right? Yeah, and... and and obviously, the indication hasn't worked because we all know who the true SP is. Well, I remember you probably heard about this story, which is again kind of near the end. It's just a point after I finished my RPF, was back is like 2002 or three. He has that tape called Can We Ever Be Friends, which is designed yeah. as a tool. You already know about this story? Yeah. No, 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 go ahead. No, no, I knew, I know the tape. <laughs> we were all called to a muster, the entire base. At lunch, it was just was it an hour before lunch, like eleven o'clock, and I forget who it was that got up there. Either Lisa Schroer or somebody. 
or it might have been Greg Wellhair who was still kind of in it. A lot of these guys were in position, and they were no longer in position, and they were back. Anyway, he was the face. He says he read a message from Dave saying, "This is I'm, I'm sending this to all of you. You need to listen to this and take it to heart because I really hope we can be friends." Something like that. In other words, the whole point being, he's playing it to the base as were the suppressors on him. And I'm sitting there again. I'm like, hey, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I always look around, you know. <laughs> most of it, we remember most of it, like, this is ridiculous. You know, this is just well, and, Jim, and Jim, just for our viewers out there, for people like Jim to be called a suppressive person, you saw all the buildings that he built, okay, at Scientology, you know what I mean? He was a very trusted person. He did a lot of great things, you know what I mean? And this is supposedly a suppressive person. I mean, it's just, it's totally contrary. It makes no sense whatsoever. Well, even itself, it's, 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 he, it's a wrong target. It's a wrong use of the tool. And he does, it's a generality. Itself suppressive yeah. to the entire base. You're playing this because we have to have some called, you know, realization that we're the ones suppressing him. Well, and, and to be honest with you, Jim, that was my final realization was that he was not playing with the same rules that we were yeah. before when Hubbard was the right. I went, he's not going to change. And then when we left, Janice and I and a bunch of us, we all got together here in Las Vegas. And when we first got out, we were still Scientologists. We all thought, well, we'll just wait till Ron Hubbard comes back. And then, you know, he'll sort it out. And we'll come back. And that's how much of a believer we were when we left and then yeah. slowly but surely we peeled the onion and then yeah, yeah we went no we're not doing that well I, when i was in ray's office i read this advice it was like six pages in detail from him to ray about mm -hmm. it's called organization of your unit which was about how it was to take on and he says for a few years you need to take on the bulk of maintaining the standardness of tech you know and he so he, you know, that was when he's definitely was planning, you know, somehow planning to come back, but I yeah. <laughs> no, I know. Hey, we got a super uh, chat, super chat uh, question here from Anthony. Thank you so much, Anthony. How oh. did the Sea Org react to Quentin's death, Janice? Well, I didn't go around asking people. A lot of, there was shock, <laughs> definite shock and surprise that he did, you know, that he committed suicide. And we are going to do a whole show on that. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll save, save more information for later. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Hey, by the way, we're going to be cutting off questions here in a minute because it's just going pretty late. So anyway, if you got a question, get in there now, Janice, and then at a certain point, let's we'll stop uh, starring these so things. We, okay? We're going to have to have you back, Jim. This is too good. Mm -hmm. I yeah, you know, I, yeah, because honestly, just between Sarah and I, we can, we talk about these things once in a while, but yeah. You know, that's like an 18 year period of my life that helps straighten out my own, you know, you know, straight wire my own line and, and remember things. Like I, I had forgotten about that thing with Amy. I just saw her note. I go, oh, crap. I do. Remember yeah. That. Yeah. It's that's what's great. That's how we basically have healed ourselves is talking amongst friends and people like you, Jim, who I haven't talked to in 33 years. But I remember yeah. we had great times. But yeah. then talking about, you know, common things that happen is you, you make sure you remember things and and sort things out because you know a lot of people don't weren't in the know as to what you know the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing and then when they get the information it helps to straighten things out yeah okay we got a question here uh meg b a member of our channel thank you very much meg i wonder what annie and pat thought about lrh and how sick he got i can't imagine the cognitive dissidence that would require did danny ever talk about that at all um uh when you were there jim well, to me, she always seemed sad, a little sad and a little mm -hmm. bit introverted, you know, yeah. and I think that's when I, you know, Ray told me that he was trying to get her through this non-interference zone, that particular period of those auditing sessions or whatever, that, but she seemed sad, you know, yeah. I mean, she always had, you know, she'd give me some anecdotes here and there about him, but I could tell she seemed, you know, to respect him and care for him for sure. But you, you got to realize that for six to seven six years he was the only company she really had yeah that's that's a whole crazy thing yeah because there was pat who gets kicked out and he's only there and sneaks in at night time so that hubbard wouldn't know he was there and then you got sarge who's mostly working with the animals but sarge was there he was the only terminal and he had and i remember even sarge saying to me 
Uh, he said, oh, yeah, Annie used to get so pissed off at Hubbard. She would come storming in from the trailer and just throw stuff around. And I am so sick of that old man. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, think about it from her position. You know, you're a young uh, woman. She, you know, and your life is being dictated in a very personal way. Like, yes. I can't even imagine. Janice, I'm sure you felt like you dodged dodged a big one when Pat and Annie were the ones chosen at X when Hubbard took off, right? Oh, yeah. I was, I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I wanted to anyway, like Thanks very much for that question. Next question here. We got Joni Cummings statement. Do you three realize how happy I see these three beautiful souls Scientology could not crush. Question, do you think that people from other cults are being helped by telling your stories? Hey, thanks very much for that nice comment, uh, Joni. Uh, do you think that people from other cults are being helped by telling your stories? Janice, why don't you answer that? Yes, I actually have a friend who grew up as a Je Jehovah's Witness, and she left, and her parents are still in, and she watches my show, and it helps her. She sees that there is hope and that there's other people in the same boat as her. Okay. Thanks very much for that question. Here's a question from uh, Moon Edge Daydream. Question. Were doubts ever raised about the legality of L. Ron Hubbard's will? Also, did an independent executor oversee the dispersal of his estate or did he appoint someone on staff to do it? He appointed Norman. Well, Norman Starkey was appointed. Whether Hubbard did it or not, that was a question. I think it was litigated. Uh, Lori Wallersheim uh, had a lawsuit, and, and and basically, I think he had some family members or whatever challenging whether or not L. Ron Hubbard actually Nibs. signed his will. Nibs was challenging it. Yeah, L. Ron Hubbard Jr. was challenging it, and the courts said that he did sign it. But uh, anyway, how about you, Jim? Did you ever hear anything about that? You no, know, just from what Norm to Norman told me, and it made some sense, is that he was selected. He actually told me, I remember the first thing, because it was all new, it was all happening. He passes away. A week later, whenever you were told, you know, get these guys and send them, then we were at ASI for a couple of days, and we're just getting quickly crash trained on what our responsibility is to be, which then, of course, gets canceled the moment I meet Annie. Um, yeah. <laughs> but he, he was surprised. He didn't think he would be it. He thought it would probably be Dave or Annie. Right. Well, you know, the will before that one, the final one that he signed, the will before that, Pat Broker was the trustee of the estate. But and I and I was wondering why was Pat removed from that and Norman put on it when Pat was a loyal officer. Well, then I later find out that Pat had been kicked out of Creston. Right. was in bad with Hubbard when he died. So, of course, it made sense to me that it wasn't Pat. Yeah, he wanted Ray to sex check him. Right. And well, how about, did you ever hear? Ordered. And he wouldn't show up. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then he had already ordered David Mayo to sex check Miss Gavage, and then the worksheets never got, no, Jesse Prince. Yeah. And yeah. then David Mayo was to do Pat, right? Right. David Mayo did sex check Pat, and Jesse Prince sex checked DM. And the reports on that never got to Hubbard because they were removed from the mailbox by the two people who did the courier runs, Dave right. and Pat. Right. And that was yeah. told to me by Sarge. Yeah. I don't doubt it. Because I did, I can tell you, Norman's reaction was he was sort of like, he didn't know what to do. You know, he, like, he was just learning it. So he's just, you know, he made some sort of quip. Yeah, you and me both or something like that about what are we supposed to do with this, you know? Hey, right. hey, Jim, Jim, from your end of things, did you ever hear anything about the loyal officer issue and all that sort of thing? Because it was out and then it was pulled back. Only you know what, what I mean? Dave himself showed me when I came back. He spent about an hour with me showing me in the period that we were up there, a year and a half, other HCOBs and PLs had come out. And he yeah. was showing me the ones that showed what Hubbard himself wrote. And then he was showing these kind of bold parts of the very same ones, which he said, Pat, add it. OK, he's told me that the loyal officer thing was just there's not, you know, we can't find anything from from Hubbard saying to do that. So this is, really, you know, again, this is like the first time I'm back kind of seeing Dave on the base. Yeah. So I'm like, OK, he yeah. seemed he was very open and very kind and just kind of showing me these things. And it made some sense because I would even read these even when they came out. And I think others will have a similar thing. They just didn't ring right. Some of them, you know, like 
a lot of wordy things that weren't really adding any understanding to anything. You know? Well, you know, the funny, the crazy thing that I remember thinking at the time and to this day, I still think was out of, out of character of Hubbard is he promoted himself to Admiral yet. He was dead. You know what I mean? It's like, and he retired the term Commodore and he promoted himself to Admiral when he died. But that's what I I'm mean, saying. It made about no Pat. sense to me. Yeah, Pat had like a whole other thing going on there. You know what I mean? You need crystals and pyramid power and stuff. He was, I'm just saying, he was, a, he could be a very nice man. Don't get me wrong. You know, but he, oh, yeah. he, he yeah. would go somewhere, you know. Yeah, my sister told me a story where she and Dave had to meet Pat at a bar. And they go in. Of course. And, and Pat's at the bar. He's been drinking. And they come up to him and he's like, wait, I'm in session. <laughs> and then there's like, he sits there and then finally goes, okay, what is it? <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget the free association he did in the back of the van when we were taken to the hospital because he collapsed. You know, he got waking up in the middle of the night smelling whiskey. He just went into something about the counterattack on earth and stuff and i'm looking around at ray and the other people i knew who know tech i'm like and ray just gives me one of these like i knew it was bullshit you know just from yeah. ray's little because you know i had worked with ray as his org officer and i i trusted him on particularly something technical he could go and telling you you know the counterattack against earth is sitting there anyway <laughs> yeah no, I, 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 same way. I mean, that was the way it was explained to me by Miss Gavage that it made sense to get rid of Pat because he was on another planet, right? Yeah. But how about Annie? Because I never really had any interactions with him. You said she looked sad and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I don't, Janice, was she strong enough to be able to, if, if, if she had been in charge? No. You, you got to remember, she's gone for six years. And she's only with one or two people in all those six years. Yeah. And you want her to come back now and suddenly take over the running of an international organization. She couldn't do it. Yeah. Pat controlled her completely. I can tell yeah. you that in that year and a half when I was seeing them together, she would just do whatever he said. Yeah. Right. Which doesn't make sense since she was the one left in charge and he was the one kicked out but she was subservient to Pat. Well, again, and that's where Ray had told me that she wasn't in a good place. We had told anybody he was trying to get her through that, whatever yeah. auditing. He said that somehow she, he started, she started getting sex checked or something. And he thought it was Pat, like was trying to just, you know, like in the middle of the OT level, you know, whatever. And I don't know anything about any of those, you know what I mean? I'm just saying that, see, you know, I could tell like she wasn't in a strong mental state, put it that way. When right. Pat was gone, she'd be great. You know, we take care of the horses. She was very good, very good communication, high, high affinity. She had all those qualities. When Pat was there, she would kind of just not say anything, you know. Yeah. Right. Okay, next question. We got a super chat. Uh, Anon A, thank you so much for that super chat. What was Hubbard's mental state the last years? Uh, he was by himself, and he was not doing well from what we were told, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, he'd had strokes and uh, Sarge told stories about Hubbard being very, you know, afraid and skittish and that type of thing. Right, Janice? Yeah. And he was having headaches because Sarge said when he was witnessing the sign of the will, Hubbard was like yelling, just get it done. Where, where do I sign? I need to go lie down. Right. Yeah. He was not in good health. No, that's for sure. Okay, thank you so much for that super chat. Janice, let's, let's cut off the questions at this point. I'm going to Yeah, and then we'll here. just reschedule with Jim, and we'll also yeah. see if we can get Amy on here, and all four of us can chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, Free Zeno Project question. What did any broker get so upset with LRH about? Did he get mad at her, or don't we know? Just I don't have any probably, details right? on that. She probably just got frustrated with dealing with him because he was, could be cranky, right, Janice? Oh, yeah, he could be very cranky. <laughs> Okay, next question here is from Betsy Crutcher. Totally off topic, but does DM ever have a girlfriend? I can't imagine he's celibate. Um, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. Mitch Brisker says that Laurie Stukenbrock is his uh, girlfriend, of and course. I don't know because I wasn't there. What do you say? Well, they were like thick as thieves, those two. That's when I came out of the RPF. Laurie said, I kept going, where's Uwe? You know, and I had taken, Uwe was a good friend of mine. 
and I knew he was dealing with his his illness and all, but I'm like, yeah, Larry, he seemed like a good person four years earlier. You know, the RPF gave me this kind of like, you know, four years and suddenly I'm seeing her with Dave driving all time of the night and complaining yeah. about everything. <laughs> well, if Shelly's still around and married to Dave, I would say Larice is not a girlfriend, but a mistress. Oh, yeah. No, I would. Yeah. Sorry. my personal. Yeah, but no, that's OK. But also, you know what? If Larice is still around, hey, there's no reason. He's doing something to keep her around because... You know what I mean? Not many people stick around Miscavige and don't end up, you know, like you said, Jim, in the RPF or doing something else. I mean, the people that were the most loyal and worked for him the longest, they all ended up, you know, digging ditches somewhere at some point. <laughs> I don't think she ever has. Anyway. Uh, next question uh, at Jim. Hi, I have a question for Sarah. What was her last post? Was she a, was she a Cunningham? Yes. She was married to... Uh... Liam, or guys, from Ian. <laughs> Ian. Ian, his brother's Liam, and I always get confused. His yeah. brother was Patty. Oh, I remember. I remember Ian. Cunningham. Remember Ian? Yeah, I remember he used him. to fight swords, sword fighting in the ghettos of, of um, Glasgow. Anyway, yeah. <coughs> Her last post was she was the uh, int, uh, international landlord, which is sort of construction around the whole planet. And she also at one point was the in fin in finance director um, in charge of all of it. Yeah, that was after I left. Yeah. I worked, I worked with her on the ship project. Yeah. But actually, to be totally accurate, in her last post, she was in the States doing gardening. Oh. You know, oh okay. was, you know, everybody gets. Busted. I did a lot of gardening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and go for chasing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I had all, all flows of the subject. You know. As a matter of fact, you mentioned Jay, Joe Canine, uh, Jim, when I blew the first time because I blew with the intention to go to the RPF. When I came back, I was made deputy D weeder under Joe. Oh, Canine. <laughs> that whole subject, I thought, God, Joe, you, you know, take, just beat that anyway. Next time you see him on a bike, I'll back you up. A block <laughs> ended up in his head or something. I mean, come on, this is. Ridiculous. It's so evil, you know, it's so vile. Yeah. It's, uh, Next question here. We're going to get wrapping up here. Uh, Joni Cumming is another member of our channel. Janice, Mark, and James, do you feel better now that you are left Scientology and you're able to tell your stories? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question from Jeffrey Ammerman. Does Church Scientology still own the Creston property? If so, is it empty like the orgs? They do own it. Who knows what's going on there? Yeah, it's part know. of the CST Corporation, which is part of the church, right? Yes. Yeah, and they bought they bought like all of old Hubbard's it looks old like houses. It's pretty empty there. now from those photos. Yeah. There's no way that they probably got rid of all the horses, the llama. That I yeah, you would it, you would have seen in those aerial photos animals out in the pastures. You Buffalo's look like they're all. Liam hard. did yeah. not like horses. I don't think horses. he likes any living thing, really. Yeah. Yeah, no, he used to go on at my sister for having horses. Exactly. All right, let's see what else we got here. Um, we got two more here. Uh, Japan of Green Gables asks, uh, sorry I'm late. Do you guys know why Rhonda, Rhonda Wolf had the nickname Nibs? Was he a nice guy, or did you guys not really know him at all? He was long gone before we got there. Yeah. yeah. But I was told that it was a name that De uh, Hubbard gave him. I got that from this girl named Adams. What was her first name? She, when I did that DC thing, we had we took this woman to dinner who used to play the organ for the like State of Man lectures. She oh, was still okay. alive. She gave us, you know, this is in like '84. She remembers Nibs taking, you know, like Ellery's put the money down. And according to her, everybody would go. Nibs would come and take the uh, tip, take the tip money. But oh, she had said that that was a name that Hubbard told, called him. Yeah, that's what I've also heard. He's always called him Nibs. Okay. Anyway, oh, what did we? So it says, wait, did you just say an organization of the church bought the old properties of the church? No, I mean, they bought private properties that were owned by L. Ron Hubbard and also 
owned by other people like because they bought houses like in elizabeth new jersey that he lived in in 1950 when he wrote dianetics and so phoenix. and phoenix arizona and places mm -hmm. in washington dc so that's that's who they bought them from they didn't buy them from scientology uh that's the last mm -hmm. of our questions jim we want to thank you for being sure. here we really appreciate it. it's great to talk to you after all this time well, and great. we would love to have you back because uh we're doing a whole thing about, you know, Pat and Annie and the takeover and all that. And so, you know, if you've got more information, we would love it, you know. Yeah, well, probably you'll be able to tell me. Like I said, for that year and a half, I, I only could tell you one side of it. And... <laughs> <laughs> well, we're known as the History Channel, so <laughs> we're all from history. So we'll get back with you and schedule doing this again. Yeah. And if you want to watch, you know, Mitch Brisker's interviews, I mean, yeah, we did we did the first we did the first interviews with them. He contacted us just like, you know, and then we did them. So yeah, they're really great, you know. Um, but Jim, don't don't uh, stay with us, okay? Even when we end the chat thing, because oh, okay. we'll talk to you off the air, okay? So just okay. hang in with us. Okay. I got to do a little bit of business here. Uh, please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. When we started this broadcast, we were thirty-one subscribers away from seven thousand. So please, if you're watching and you haven't subscribed and you enjoy our show, hit that subscribe button. We would greatly appreciate it the more people we get subscribed the more people see our videos and that's how the youtube algorithm works so please subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already and as i mentioned and, before yeah and, and then rock, 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 slam, rock slam the like button all right rock slam it as janice says if you want to become a member of our channel click the join on our home our channel homepage. if you have any questions that we missed Ask in the comment section. Janice and I check them all the time, and we will be happy to, uh, you know, answer them. Also, if you uh, are a peeling master, I know there's Ion Life and uh, a couple others. We need your contact information so we can send you your autograph book and also do our, our monthly one-on-ones with you. So email Janice Gillum Grady at gmail.com with your contact information, and that will make it easier. And that's for the people that are at the peeling master level. Okay. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that too. Uh, Janice and Jim, do you guys have anything else you want to say before we end off? Well, no, thank you I... for the opportunity. You're welcome. No, Jim, it's great to see you, man. It's really good. Yeah. Well, you guys start yeah. recognizing names again. <laughs> yeah. So, so stay there, Jim, while Mark. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to say bye-bye, everybody. Bye.